Yes? Yeah. Okay, members, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the weekly meeting of the ERA committee, starting at the earlier time um, of nine. Uh, we're just going live now. We, we didn't just before this. Um, we're we're correct at the minute, so which is good. Um, and you have clarified any of your issues um, in terms of the, your, the technology and the use of Starleaf. Um, I want to advise members that there are a number of items in the agenda from last, meets, last, week's, meets, meets, last week's meeting that weren't considered due to time constraints and we have been carried forward today. So listen, we're going to have a very tight agenda, so try to keep it uh, as concise as possible. And you know yourselves, if you want to make contact or you want to speak, uh, just drop a wee message into the um, into the, uh, the 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 WhatsApp, and I'll note just here on the page. Um, okay. On the agenda today, uh, members, you having difficulty hearing me? It was a bit wobbly there, Declan. Your seconds are yes, You're breaking up. I'm breaking up. Yeah. Testing. Can you? Is that any better there? No. Can you hear me? Hello. I'm clear. A bit clear. Yeah. Maybe I'll keep yeah. my head still. Will be a good thing, will it? So, on the agenda today, then we have um, an oral briefing from Claire Bailey on the climate change bill. Oral evidence from Belfast City Council and Uriam Morn on the issue of security at the ports, and oral evidence from Nature Friendly Farming Network. There will also be a closed session at the end of the meeting to discuss the legal advice to the committee on the review of the process uh, for area-based schemes. Um, so uh, we are in open. We already are in open session. Okay. So um, the, as we know from previously members, the. Uh, Committee meeting will be recorded, broadcast through apartment buildings and uh, online. And you can use your mobile voices, but uh, devices, but make sure they're muted um, and not interfering with the sound. Uh, I don't have any apologies for today's meeting. Uh, Chairperson's business. Um, I want to refer members to the note of the informal meeting. Uh, the chairs from the economy, the executive office, and myself, and the NAFRS committee on the 15th of April. That's on page six. Uh, of your pack. And are members okay to note this? Okay. Draft minutes. Um, I want to refer members to the draft minutes from the 22nd of April at page 9. Uh, are members, uh, can members uh, are okay without those minutes? Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I'm actually physically present today. We're, we're doing a, a hybrid version today where I'm in here. So I, I, am, I am physically available to sign these today. So I will be doing so. Okay, members, um, given the recent evidence from various witnesses in connection with the committee's work on the withdrawal of staff, various correspondences re by, received by various members and building on the experiences of other committees that undertook similar work on the Red Sky Inquiry and the Casement Park Inquiry, can I ask that the clerk to provide some procedural advice on issues such as privilege, procedural fairness, and the time scale required for the committee to deliberate on and agree its draft report, uh, report. Stella, can I ask you to uh, brief the committee? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Okay, members, um, we're resuming the uh, agenda here again. Item number four, matters arising. Let me see if we're just waiting for to open. Oh, sorry. Right here, we're in open. And open now. Okay, members, um, matters arising. I uh, want to refer members to email correspondence to Patsy uh, at page 17, alongside a further item of email correspondence which has been tabled. Can I ask Patsy to speak to members about the email and then I will seek comments from members? Patsy? Uh, thanks very much indeed, Chair. Um, the email that's tabled before members, as, as members will know, it, it relates to. Um, uh, mention is made in the email to a person who is before the assembly, the ongoing live inquiry, and um, because it does relate uh, specifically and names that person indeed twice, I felt it would obviously be in the interest of openness, transparency, and fairness uh, that that be passed on forthwith to uh, the committee. I have also responded to the author of the email to advise uh, him that there is a live inquiry 
and that indeed the person to whom uh, he refers is being recalled as part of that inquiry and that uh, his request, he wanted to communicate with me, he wanted to arrange a meeting with me and that I felt it would not be appropriate uh, to have a meeting about that or related matters uh, during an inquiry, a live assembly inquiry. So for that reason, I have, and I did inform the person and he's come back again, um, but um, the, the correspondence is before members so that members are fully aware of that and are, are fully aware that um, I have been communicated on about a person who is before the, the inquiry. Okay. Um, okay, thank you, Patsy. Any comments from any of the other members in relation to Patsy's, what Patsy has said? Okay. Do we have any other comments relating to it? Um, can, um, can I, uh, can, can I uh, seek agreement to publish the emails on the committee webpage? Members, can yeah. just clarify, do you want the actual emails with all the, um, can I suggest that we, we take out the, the, um, the, the second name and the email address? Members okay yeah. with that? We redact it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Chair, could, could I maybe suggest that, um, yes, I, I agree to the redaction of, of the name and interest of privacy, but just maybe with the caveat, in case anything further does emerge uh, during the course of the inquiry, um, that that be subject to review. Yes. Okay. Members okay, okay. with that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, okay. Chair. Robin. Okay, members, uh, we're going to move on now to item five on the agenda. It's uh, oral evidence session. Uh, Did John Blair want in? Sorry, John, do you want, did you, do you indicate you're looking in there in that last matter? Sorry, John. Uh, Chair, I appreciate that, that Patsy uh, provided this information and has spoken in the interest of, of openness and transparency. It strikes me that the matters addressed in the correspondence are not the business of the committee and would not be under any circumstances and, and um, I would suggest that if we're, we're going to reply at all that that should be reflected. Okay, thank you John. Thank you for that. Okay, members, um, I'm going to move on now to item 5, it's an oral evidence session on the climate change bill. Uh, we, um, I want to refer members to the briefing paper uh, from Claire, Claire Billy, MLA, at page 19, and a copy of the draft bill at page 29. I want to welcome uh, the following witnesses by Starleaf, Claire Billy, MLA, Amanda Slevin, Chair of the Climate Change Climate Coalition NI, uh, Anuri Deb, uh, PhD student at Queen's, Phil Carson, Land Use Policy Officer at RSPB, and I'd like to invite the, upper, uh, the, the representatives to, to brief the committee, and the members will want to see, ask some questions thereafter. So you're very uh, welcome this morning. Well, thank you very much, Chair, and good morning, committee. It's a bit strange <laughs> doing with you this morning in the hot seat, <laughs> but I really very much welcome the invite and the opportunity to brief the committee today on the actual detail contained within the Climate Change Bill Northern Ireland 2021 as introduced. Um, and as the chair has outlined, <coughs> the witnesses um, are present here with me today to, to answer any questions that the committee may have. Um, I'll give you, hopefully, a, just a bit of a background to how the bill came about and also what's contained within the bill as it is currently structured. So this bill originates from the Climate Coalition Northern Ireland, the CCNI, uh, that's a network of organisations and individuals formed in early 2020 and representing over 400 people across Northern Ireland. As Northern Ireland's largest civic society network for climate action, the CCNI has as its very priority the development of an ambitious climate change bill for Northern Ireland based on the best available science to be introduced as a matter of urgency. And this bill, as drafted, seeks to achieve a number of measures that I will outline. Um, the Climate Bill aims to declare a climate emergency and establish this as a mandate for climate change mitigation and adaptation in Northern Ireland, ensure that Northern Ireland meets net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2045, 
mandate the executive within three years of the passing of the bill to prepare five yearly climate action plans to ensure that Northern Ireland meets net zero by 2045. Make provision for climate governance and advice, including the establishment of a Northern Ireland Climate Commissioner and Northern Ireland Climate Office. Guarantees non-regression in NI law from existing climate and environmental protections contained in EU law as it applied before the end of Brexit transition period. And the bill, as members will be aware, was published on the 22nd of March 2021. So the background of this bill is that uh, there is both scientific and public and political consensus on the need to introduce climate change legislation for Northern Ireland. And the Lisa Cook survey in February 15 showed that 68% of people in Northern Ireland wanted to see a target for NI to reach net zero by 2045. And according to the UN IPCC's 2018 report, they say rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented change in all as aspects of society are needed in order to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. We must cut global greenhouse gas emissions by 45% by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050. The introduction of a climate act for Northern Ireland was committed to in the new decade new approach. The executive, it says, the executive will introduce legislation and targets for reducing carbon emissions in line with the Paris Climate Accord. The executive should bring forward a climate change act to give environmental targets a strong legal underpinning. In February 2020, the assembly voted to declare a climate emergency and called on the executive to fulfill the climate action and environmental commitments set out under NDNA. In July 2020, the Northern Ireland Assembly again passed a motion calling for the urgent introduction of a Climate Change Act for Northern Ireland within three months. The Minister's response to this was that he would not support the motion and that the language used, such as emergency and crisis, should not be used. It was following this that this bill was drafted. Now, this bill is a primary legislation and so it's not prescriptive. It is a framework bill setting out the legislative basis upon which to build future climate policy. The bill sets out a substantive pathway to decarbonisation for Northern Ireland, ensuring that transparency and democratic oversight is there at every stage and guaranteeing independent monitoring so that this democratic oversight can be effective. The bill is divided into three parts and is made up of 17 clauses and two schedules. A more detailed overview of the key provisions contained within the bill by way of a clause-by-clause -clause explanation is provided to members of Appendix C, should members find this helpful. But a brief overview then, um, in Clause 1, provides for the declaration of a climate emergency from the date of Royal Assent. In declaring a climate emergency, we acknowledge that climate change exists and that the measures taken up to this point have not been enough to address it. We recognise the role that governments have to play in introducing measures that will halt climate change. This state of climate emergency will outlive successive assembly terms. Its annulment requires assembly approval and must be on the basis of verifiable proof from a relevant body the CCC or the IPCC or the Republic of Ireland's Climate Advisory Council, that the global temperature threshold defined in the Paris Agreement or any subsequent agreement has been met. The relevant bodies are the UK, UK Committee on Climate Change, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the Climate Advisory Council in the Republic of Ireland. The three bodies have been listed with a view to ensuring that the Assembly has before it the widest possible information on the state of climate change mitigation efforts on a planet-wide basis. This is because of the interconnected nature of climate change, so that the Assembly can take a holistic view on whether to annul an emergency. It is important to note that throughout the rest of the bill, most duties to take account of expert advice refers only to the UK CCC, because this is the only body statutorily mandated under Section 38 of the Climate Change Act 
2008 to provide assistance sought by devolved authorities. The other two bodies do not self-evidently have such duties, and nor is it within the Assembly's competence to create such duties on these bodies. So the Assembly can redeclare a climate emergency at any point. In Clause 2, this relates to the creation of a climate action plan. Climate action plans are policy documents detailing steps that will be taken to address challenges of climate change in Northern Ireland. The climate action plans must be approved by the Assembly and they must achieve the overriding climate objective. This is the establishment of the Northern Ireland, the establishment in Northern Ireland of a net zero carbon, climate resilient and environmentally sustainable, sustainable economy by the year 2045. This target of 2045 is an ambitious target, but achievable one that recognises a general legislative trend towards ambitious climate legislation. The net zero year may be altered by order of the Executive Office, but cannot be amended to a year after 2045. Each climate action plan is prepared by the Executive Office and laid before the Assembly for its approval. And the first climate action plan must be laid within three years of the bill being enacted and every five years thereafter. Clause 2 also defines aspects of the overriding climate objective, such as net zero and climate resilient, and lists the seven greenhouse gases that must be included in the net zero target. Clause 3 states that the climate action plans will be made up of two parts, targets and measures. Targets will be interim targets for greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity, water quality and soil quality. This is because climate change is caused by greenhouse gas emissions, but manifests itself in declining water quality, soil quality and biodiversity. Any climate action plan must therefore consider these three key areas as performance indicators. Measures looks at how targets will be implemented. Measures in the bill include carbon budgets, nitrogen budgets and sectoral plans across the Northern Ireland economy. Clause 3 also sets out what must be taken into account when setting targets. Targets are set after obtaining advice from the relevant expert body, the UKCCC, and must take certain things into account, including international law, the impact the target will have on the environment, public health and well-being, and the Northern Ireland specific economic and social circumstances. This is key to ensuring that targets that are set are fair and do not disproportionately impact upon one group while simultaneously ensuring that the bill is effective and achieves its overriding climate objective. The reference to specific economic and social circum circumstances are important, given that these are not static and that the state of Northern Ireland's economy will be of obvious importance when setting interim targets. Other provisions in Clause 3 include details of what must be taken into account in carbon budgets and nitrogen budgets, including the requirement to take transboundary impacts into account, requirements for DERA to create a scheme to track carbon usage and purchase of carbon units, requirement to take transboundary and details of what sectors must be included in sectoral plans and the just transition principles that these plans must be subject to. The inclusion of the just transition principles in the bill are an important part of ensuring that the change to a net zero carbon society will mean a better and a fairer society for all. So sectoral plans must support jobs and growth of jobs that are climate resilient and environmentally and socially sustainable, support net zero carbon investment and infrastructure, create work which is high value, fair and sustainable, reduce inequality as far as possible and reduce with a view to eliminating poverty and social deprivation. Clause 4 in the Bill uh, provides for implementation reports to be laid before the Assembly each year for the duration of the Climate Action Plan. 
it sets out how these reports should be set out and what they should contain. This includes whether the annual target has been met, reasons for failure to meet targets, and if they have not been met, progress on each sectoral policy and the likelihood of full policy implementation and the likelihood of the overriding climate objective being achieved. Clauses 5 to 10 and schedules 1 to 2 establish the Northern Ireland Climate Office and the Northern Ireland Climate Commissioner and outline that the Climate Commissioners are outline that the Climate Commissioner's powers and functions. So the Climate Commissioner will provide independent scrutiny and oversight of the Act, similar to the Public Services Ombudsman, and the Climate Commissioner will not be under the direction of any department or minister, the Assembly, the Assembly Commission, or any local authority. The manner of appointment of the Climate Commissioner by the Crown on nomination by the Assembly is to allow maximum independence from government. The Climate Commissioner will not have enforcement powers, but similarly to independent climate bodies in other jurisdictions, they will have the power to make recommendations and raise issues that the Executive will then be mandated to address. The Climate Commissioner has powers to obtain any information necessary to audit the effectiveness of climate action plans, but this power must be balanced against the rights of any individual pursuant to the Human Rights Act 1998 under clauses 10, 4, A, 2. The Climate Commissioner will have two main functions to monitor the implementation of climate action plans and make annual reports to the Assembly on this issue to produce at least once per assembly term an independent review report on the functioning and effectiveness of the Act and to recommend any amendments considered necessary to achieve the overriding climate objective. These functions create an important statutory discourse which allow climate action plans to be flexibly rooted in an independent science and democratic accountability. So, Moving on to Clause 11, this relates to the alteration of climate action plans following the Climate Commissioner's annual report. Following the laying of the annual report by the Climate Commissioner, the Executive Office must prepare its response, including any proposed alterations to targets or measures. In altering the cap, the Executive must not either directly or indirectly lower targets or standards. These alterations must be approved by the Assembly. Clause 12 provides a duty that there must be no regression on environmental standards that were in place when Northern Ireland left the European Union. This is already a condition of the Withdrawal Act and nothing in this bill will override an Act of Parliament or affect the sovereignty of the Crown in Parliament. And that finishes my brief and I want to thank the committee for that time and we would welcome any questions that members may have. Okay, um, thank you Claire and it's uh, interesting to see you at the, on the other side of the, the table today so it is. <laughs> um, thank you very much for that uh, very detailed, um, detailed uh, overview of the proposed bill. Um, there's, there's a couple of uh, pointers I want to just pick up yourself uh, and the, the team here today. Um, uh, first, one of them, you, you mentioned the um, impact on the sectors and that the bills specify that there can't be a disproportionate impact on any one particular group. And uh, I will say, you know, as chairperson of, of this committee, um, the, the, there, I have been approached by a lot of concern from the, the agricultural sector uh, regarding this, and indeed I was a, a speaker at the Ulster Farmers Union AGM yesterday, and, and this was um, a topic that was probably one of the most prevalent topics. Uh, there, there is a fear amongst the uh, agriculture sector that this could have a disproportionate uh, impact on them, and I think it would be um, useful if uh, some of yourselves maybe could uh, just say something that might... Um, sort of address some of their concerns uh, about this particular target and the impact that it might be, have on them. Bearing in mind, you know, 
Uh, and if, if there's anything that the recent pandemic has highlighted, it's the hugely imp huge importance of the security of a locally produced food supply uh, and our, our food production capacity and, of course, the jobs which comes with that here in the north. Chair, thank you, um, and I wholly agree with you. Um, and just to also note that we have met with various farming sector bodies, including uh, some of the unions, and we're listening very well to their concerns raised. But I want to put on record that there is nothing in our bill that will harm the agriculture sector. Agriculture is listed along with all other sectors as an area that needs to see reductions in emissions. Nothing in this bill mandates any immediate changes to the agriculture sector or, it's or is in any way prescriptive. The way that the climate action plans are designed with a carbon budget over five years, but with no specific reduction targets allocated to individual sectors, and I think that's really important to note, because that means that some sectors, for example, infrastructure, energy, transport, they are ready to move much more immediately and they can do heavy lifting over the first few years. So while agriculture can have a much more gradual transition. So this bill ensures that there will be fairness built into any measures that are introduced. Sectoral plans will have to create high value, fair work, reduce poverty, and reduce inequality. Um, and I know that the UFU in particular have been broadly opposed to this bill, but we have also met with other farming and rural groups who are supportive of it um, and are ready to work with the department um, members to ensure that farmers get paid to manage land sustainably. So we do need to look at Northern Ireland's farming and its economic and social environmental sustainability because we know that the average age of farmers in Northern Ireland is 59. We desperately need a new deal for Northern Ireland's farmers, which encourages young people to take up farming and ensures that a profitable and sustainable industry is there for them in the decades ahead, where they are paid for sustainable land management practices. And the total number of farms in Northern Ireland has fallen from 32,000, um, just over 32,000 to um, just under 25,000 since 1997. You know, that's not climate action. That's the threat to farmers. It's business as usual and the pursuit of an intensification model. But with your permission, I would like to um, maybe bring Philip in um, and maybe speak to a few of those concerns that you've raised as well, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you, Claire. And yeah, completely recognise the, the potential concerns there. Um, it's a stretch to get to where we need to go, but I would just reiterate the points that Claire was saying that it's not climate action which will impact the, the interests of farming, it's climate change. We've already seen um, through severe weather in 2017 and 2018 the significant economic costs of climate change in agriculture. So there's around £161 million pounds, um, of cost to Scottish industry because of climate change. There's been global assessments on global productivity loss, and they found that that's reduced productivity by 21% since the 1960s because of climate change. If we don't move towards a path, a path of sustainable land management and reduce warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, then that's going to impact future global food security, and we need to avoid that. We need to move towards a system of sustainable land management, and I think it's going to be a system where farmers are food producers, are also delivering on climate, are also delivering for nature as well and providing those benefits to society. And that provides economic benefits to them in terms of not having all their eggs in one basket. And if we can potentially move towards a more agroecological food system, that can create more jobs. We want to see more jobs in the countryside. We want to see farmers with a viable future. And we think climate change action is key to that. Um, thank you for that answer. And uh, I will say that um, you know, farmers are on the front line when it comes to climate change, and I know uh, down down my part of the world in the Spurns there a number of years ago we had the the, the landslides in the Glenelly and Own Kalew valleys, uh, devastated over a thousand hectares of land, and it totally devastated uh, those farm businesses <laughs> in that area. Um, one of the things I just want to, another question I just want to mention here before we we just move on. Uh, there's members of uh, want to ask some questions as well. You made reference there um, to the 
the tra transboundary. There's a transboundary dimension in this bill, and that's that's hugely important. I think it's hugely important given the fact that we um, we, we share a, a land border with a with a, another jurisdiction. We're, we're on the same island, uh, but we, we have got two jurisdictions on this one island. Um, I suppose one of the things that I might want to ask is that the the the, the climate uh, bill in the south is working towards the twenty as as late as 2050 for net zero, which is in line with Paris. Yes, we're working in line uh, for a 2045 target. Now, we need to you know, consider the transboundary issues, because if you live in counties, say, like Fermanagh or Tyrone, where, where, where I'm from and where Rosemary and others are from, you know, one side of a field could be in Leitrim and the other side could be in Fermanagh. You know, or on one side of the field could be in Monaghan and the other side could be in Tyrone and straddles the border. So if we're looking at uh, things like soil and water quality, you know, uh, and you're in two different jurisdictions but two different dates. So if we're aiming for 2045 and the South's going for 2050, would that not potentially undermine our 24, make our 2045 target very difficult if the jurisdiction beside you, where you share the same, where the, the border straddles through your fields, would, would, would make, it, make it very difficult? You know, Chair, thanks for that. You raised quite a, a number of issues in that one question. Yeah. So I'm going to ask Anurag, if possible, to, to address your transboundary issues and maybe bring in Amanda Slevin with the um, the importance of the 2045, if that's OK. Yeah. Anurag? Thank you, Claire. Uh, thank you for your question, Chair. Yes, the transboundary element in the bill is quite an important part of the Climate Action Plan. Uh, provisions, um, specifically in subclause uh, 9 uh, and also at the end of subclause 7, there are two transboundary elements. The first being that there is a single energy market on the island of Ireland, and that has to be taken into consideration when you're talking about energy supply and the infrastructure for energy supply um, necessary to decarbonize. Uh, the second is the environmental impact on Northern Ireland from activities, whether that's uh, in the south, whether that's in England, Wales, or in Scotland. Um, the impact to the environment of Northern Ireland, including its air, its waters, its um, uh, general atmosphere. So those are important elements to be taken into consideration. There's also a role in the bill for the north-south bodies under the Northern Ireland Act to play a part in providing advice and recommendations. Um, obviously, the bill does not create any duties on those bodies, but it is important that uh, their role in facilitating um, a north-south uh, interaction and a north-south overall approach to climate change is recognized in the bill. So um, there is a robust provision for networking on an all-Ireland basis to try and mitigate climate change, um, and that forms a very key part of the climate action plan and the considerations that have to go in when drafting the climate action plan by the executive office. This is to mute when they're not speaking. It's called to not feedback. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, could I ask the witnesses to mute when you're not speaking because we're causing a bit of an echo here? Is it okay? Okay, thank you for that, uh, Anurag. Um, can we have around uh, John, John Blair? John? It takes a wee while to come in. And go to the next one then. Rosemary, do you want to come in from Fermanagh? Rosemary? John Blair's in now. Oh, sorry, John Blair's in now. John, do you want to ask a question there? Yeah, yes, sure, and thank you. And the, the, the volume, the speaker wasn't allowing me to unmute there. Can I, can I thank Claire and Anya Rag, first of all, and, and the others involved in the panel for, for their work on this? Um, I should, I believe, declare an interest as a co-sponsor of the uh, bill and put that on record. Um, I think it would be useful, um, Claire mentioned there the various sectors, and it might be useful for the committee if, if the... Uh, people presenting could give us some indication of the consultation that's taken place already with various sectors and also that which is planned for the times ahead. 
Thank you for, for that, John. I'm going to bring in Amanda Slevin. Um, Amanda is also the chair of the Climate Coalition and will speak well to this point, if that's okay with you. Thanks very much, Claire. Um, I suppose the first point of consultation we'd like to highlight is our work within Climate Coalition. Um, as Claire has pointed out, um, our network is the largest civil society network for climate action in Northern Ireland. Our member organisations represent over 400,000 people across uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, and we have done an intensive consultation within our member organisations uh, throughout the, the process of the bill's development. And um, we've also undertaken a wide range of steps to engage with key stakeholders. Um, so Claire has mentioned that we've met with various farming groups to hear their concerns and, and to look at how we can advance a just transition. We've also met with uh, uh, some civil servants, some officials in DERA and other departments. We have met with energy companies. We've met with a wide range of stakeholders. And we have plans to advance our, our consultation activities as we go forward as, as the bill progresses. So we feel that we have listened to a wide range of perspectives that we're really conscious of some of the concerns that um, our, our people across society might have, but we're also conscious of the exciting opportunities that climate action presents. Um, and we believe that, and particularly within the, the bill, um, you know, it really uh, embeds the necessity for further public engagement. So we are working on that. We are advancing our engagement with key stakeholders, but the bill will mandate that as well through its climate action plans, which will require extensive public consultation to ensure that at every step of the bill or every step of the development of climate action plan, plans that diverse voices are heard and taken into account as we move forward. So I hope I, that answers your question okay. And if I could just maybe add on to that one, obviously um, you're aware then that this bill has been introduced as a private member's bill um, and hopefully the consultation process um, for a private member's bill can happen at committee scrutiny stage. Yeah. Um, and that's another point to, to note there as well. But uh, thanks. But just also on record, while there have been some sectors and some people who have raised concerns and issues or want more information, I think it's really important to put on record that there are other sectors and other people who have been very critical that this is not going fast nor far enough. Um, and yeah. you know, they would like it to be uh, more robust and more ambitious. So it's competing um, with all the different um, thoughts and views out there. But thank you for that, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Philip? Philip? Just yep, thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks very much, Claire and Anya Egg and Amanda and Phil, uh, uh, and thanks very much for uh, the, the contribution so far. I mean, I also need to put on record and declare an interest as a co-sponsor of, of the bill, uh, and, you know, somebody who's uh, obviously spoken positively in this committee and... Uh, and within the assembly chamber on the need for the north uh, to have climate legislation given that we are the only uh, jurisdiction on these islands that thus far doesn't have that. Uh, in terms of uh, Claire, when you were given your introduction, you, you mentioned uh, some of the commentary and p potential re or resistance from the, the minister uh, that brought about this bill and some of the things that he said. So now, the minister obviously has now uh, suggested that he does intend to bring forward uh, climate legislation. C can I maybe ask you, you uh, or some of the other witnesses maybe just to outline the key differences between uh, this bill and the proposed legislation that the minister uh, is Talk, talking about bringing forward and, and just I mean the chair asked the question about uh, 2045 in comparison to the south's 2050 net zero deadline so maybe if that could be uh, addressed as well. Uh, thank you Philip for that question. Um, I think it's it's an, the, the first part of your question in terms of the, the minister's bill um, it's an impossible one to answer um, because we haven't had sight of the bill and um, as far as I'm aware it has no, not been drafted as a bill yet either so I really can't speak to what might be coming forward from the minister um, I can only speak to the bill that actually exists and that is this one that has been presented to you today so until we get sight of um, anything else I, I can't really go you know it, it's just a hypothetical conversation so we we'll look forward to seeing detail but it's just not there at the minute um, and I hope that maybe answers your question on that bit and I'm going to maybe move to Amanda again there uh, in terms of the 2045 target question that you've raised if that's okay 
Thanks very much, Claire. Um, I suppose when we talk about the target within the bill, we need to think about three key areas that underpin the target. The first is which uh, the evidence uh, underpin the necessity of multi-level urgent climate action by 2045, the consequences of inaction locally and globally, and also the support that exists for transformative climate action. Um, Claire has referred earlier to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report uh, and how that has underpinned targets. Uh, globally, uh, emerging research is, is stressing that we need to go further and faster. Uh, and there's emerging research that is critiquing uh, current actions by governments saying it's not going far enough. So, for example, um, recent research by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration found that carbon dioxide and methane continue to grow in 2020 despite pandemic uh, shutdowns. And CO2 levels are now the highest any time in the past 3.6 million years. As the as Assistant Deputy Director of the Global Monitoring Lab pointed out, this is due to human activity driving climate change. We need to have a deliberate focus on re reducing emissions to get to net zero uh, quickly. The uh, recent multi-organization United in Science report emphasized that again, we need to dramatically cut um, uh, emissions. And they say that if we want to try and stay within the 1.5 temperature increases, which is the goal of the Paris Agreement, we need reductions of about 7% per year, at least between 2030, uh, 2020 and 2030. We also see the forthcoming global methane assessment, which is a United Nations report compiled by an international team of scientists, emphasize that we need quicker actions uh, if we're going to start reining in the consequences of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, a pre-release article highlights that abating methane particularly will be critical in the short term, and they warn that methane emiss emissions must be reduced globally by as much as 45% by 2030, and doing so could help uh, avoid 0.3 degrees of, of global warming by by as early as 2040s. I can continue about the science over and over. I suppose another key point is that we are already on track for at least 1.5 degree increases by 2030. Other science is saying we're looking at between two, uh, between three and five degree temperature increases. Uh, but recent research is saying that we need to mobilize near net zero emissions by 2030 and saying the message is what we do now is what matters, not aspirations by 2045 or 2050. So our science, scientists, global science are saying is we need action. We need cross cutting action uh, at multi -level, multiple levels of our, of our societies to bring about change. And, and then that ties me into the second point, uh, which is about the consequences. We know that the actions we need to take are not going to happen overnight, but we do have a very short window of opportunity to make them. If we are to help limit the temperature increases to well below uh, 2 degrees Celsius, but preferably below uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, let's look at local consequences. Um, our, the chair has talked about some of the consequences of his constituency from flooding. The uh, local climate change projections project uh, estimates that we're facing regardless of the overarching temperature uh, that we reach. We're facing hotter, drier summers, which will affect all sectors of our society. Uh, we're looking at warmer, wetter winters with more extreme weather and rising sea levels. So they highlight that without sufficient action, the high emissions scenario, the pathway that they were on, uh, states that by 2070, winters uh, could be up to 3.9 degrees Celsius warmer, and summers could be up to 4.9 degrees Celsius hotter. We're looking at wetter winters, uh, hotter summers, and we're looking in Belfast, uh, they say that uh, sea level rises could increase to 94 centimeters by, by, um, by the start of the next century. So that's really concerning. But we have to think about the inherent inequalities to the consequence that we'll face in Northern Ireland. Um, the, you know, the UK's uh, risk assessment highlights that the climate and ecological crises affects people differently based on their socioeconomic um, and cultural backgrounds. Uh, low income households are most susceptible to climate breakdown and are, are likely to have the lowest capacity and resources to adapt. So, for example, in a recent report by Belfast City Council, they highlight that uh, the highest proportions of properties at risk of flooding are in deprived areas. That's 27% of houses in deprived area are, are at risk of, of flooding. Now, this is quite small when we look uh, compared to the global consequence of it. Uh, we've talked about uh, the Intergovernmental Panel Cl uh, and Climate Change Special Report from 2018. And I think that is the most powerful warning about what we face if we don't take action now. They highlight how climate-related risks to health, livelihoods, food security, water supply, human security, and economic growth are projected to, projected to increase with global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius and increase further with 2 degrees Celsius. 
They highlight how populations at disproportionately higher risk of adverse consequences of global warming of even 1.5 degrees Celsius include disadvantaged and vulnerable populations, some indigenous peoples, and local communities dependent on agriculture or coastal livelihoods. They expect that poverty and disadvantages are expected to increase as global warming increases. And if we can limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to 2 degrees, we could reduce the number of people both exposed to climate related risks and susceptible to poverty by up to several hundred million by 2050. So that's at a global scale. But let's briefly touch, touch on some of the existing costs of our change in climate. Uh, recent research emphasized that between 2013 and 2018, there were over 4,020 weather-related loss events uh, globally. That had devastating uh, social and economic and ecological consequences. If we think of the, the social consequences, there were close to uh, 70,000 deaths because of those events. The economic cost was estimated at US dollars, $964 billion. So these are the global consequences of us collectively failing to take in action. Uh, so we know that we have to take action now to mitigate the consequences of climate change and also recognize that we in the global north have a disproportionate responsibility because we are most responsible for the emissions that are disproportionately affecting people in the global south. And we know, and my third point, uh, and I'll wrap up in a second, you know, we know that there is massive support for transformative action. We can see that on our streets, we can see that from our young people, we can see that from sure from your constituents that are contacting saying we want climate action. Scientifically, uh, close to 14,000 scientists from 156 countries have declared we are living in a climate emergency and are saying that we need climate action. And as Claire has always pointed out, that demand for action is, always, is also reflected in Northern Ireland through the, the recent poll RSPB has pointed out that RSP, RSPB has conducted, which emphasised that about um, uh, th two thirds respondents want a target of net zero by 2045. So the context is pretty clear. We need ambitious climate action, and those forces are, 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 are driving the case that we're making in the bill. Um, I'm not sure if we have time, perhaps uh, Anna can also talk to the legal um, elements of the, the 2045 target as well. Uh, thanks very much, Amanda. Yeah, the, the legal context is, uh, I think, pretty uh, short, um, to say the least. It's really reflecting changing trends and uh, emerging trends in more ambitious uh, climate change targets, um, particularly within the UK. We don't need to do a, a full global comparison for this. Um, in 2019, the UK climate change um, target was increased to 100% in the Climate Change Act of 2008. Uh, the Welsh 100% uh, net zero target was uh, increased in 2021. Uh, Scotland changed its target year to 2045 in 2020. So within the UK itself, there's a greater ambition. And the 2045 year reflected in the net zero target of the bill simply reflects that trend. So that's essentially the sort of legislative intent of it. Oh, OK. Um, thanks for that. OK, Rosemary? Rosemary? <coughs> Just takes a wee while to make up. There we go. Oh, just on Can you hear me? Yes, Rosemary. We got yeah, you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your what you've had to say so so far. Just um, bit, I'm a little bit puzzled in relation in relation to the comments that you made. In you said that you consulted with various farming groups. Uh, can you give me a clear idea who these farming groups were and who they represented? Hey, Rosemary, thank you. Yep, we've met with NIAPO, we've met with Farmers for Action, and we've met with the UFU, um, and they would be the more established groups covering the majority, if not all, of farmers um, in Northern Ireland. We've met with rural community uh, groups and Nerwin as well, and had good conversations and went through the bill with the those groups too. And all those, all those groups were very supportive of the bill? Yep. Okay, Th thank you. Um, right, there's a couple of things I, w I want to ask. It's just I, again, have been getting concerns. I've been, a number of concerns have been raised with me in relation to uh, the agricultural industry. 
and uh, in relation to this Climate Change Act and the agricultural industry, and the year of 2020, 2045, many of these, that seems to be in contrast, you talk about 2045, it seems to be in contrast to the Climate Change Committee document, which suggests 82% emissions, 82% emissions uh, in re to, uh, to, uh, 2050. Can you comment on that in relation to that? Yeah, thanks, Rosemary. And just to correct the record there, um, I want to point out that what I said yesterday, that all those groups were uh, supportive. Um, um, that, that wasn't correct. Sorry, the UFU have been very resistant and um, have big concerns about the bill. So I'm uh, sorry, I need to set the record straight. And I'm sure you, as well as I, have started receiving emails from them as well. So apologies for that. Um, but it, yes, so I want to maybe look at the CCC's recent advice in their report um, for Northern Ireland set a minimum target of 82%. Um, and I think this has been taken largely as a concrete target, a set target now. But I think it's really, really important to acknowledge that when the minister very recently contacted the CCC for further information, and I'm going to quote from them, um, and I think that the committee were also um, aware of, of this too, um, that they're saying that our recommendations on the UK's sixth bud carbon budget takes into account a set of considerations defined in the Climate Change Act. So it's the Climate Change Act, the UK 20, or 2008 one. And then they say that as new evidence on climate science behaviours or low carbon technologies emerge and or the UK's international climate commitments change, it may be prudent to tighten a 2050 target in Northern Ireland. They then say that Northern Ireland's climate legislation should allow emissions reductions to go beyond our current assessment by requiring at least, and they stress at least, 82% reduction and should contain clear provisions to tighten the target if there is evidence to support such a decision. And we have already seen similar provisions used to increase climate targets for the UK, for Scotland and for Wales since 2019. So I think that that's very clearly um, Shown, and we, we we just seen from Prime Minister Boris Johnson last week, for example, that he has made um, much more ambitious target setting agendas, um, and we need to be very wary of that one as well. But there's still also questions about the CCC's model that's being proposed, and concerns that this looks to support further intensification of the agri sector at the expense of smaller farms that are being forced out of business so that their land can be released. Um, and the CCC has explored very few pathways for change in land use and future developments in low carbon farming measures. So we all need to look at how the assumption that Northern Ireland can't reach net zero by 2050 or that output from agriculture would have to fall so significantly. So in the CCC's report, again, what they say is choices on how this additional land that's released from agriculture could be used includes less intensive farming, so e.g. Um, agroecology farming, measures to deliver deeper emissions reductions, such as tree planting, for example, and the com conversion to other uses, such as maybe wildflower meadows or natural regeneration to deliver wider environmental benefits. So the greenhouse gas impacts of these options have not been included in our scenarios due to the lack of robust evidence on the abatement potential. And that's absolutely key because if we can look in the whole, if we can get baselines, set our targets, uh, or sorry, identify um, the, the GHGs and start moving forward on that one, there is the potential that Northern Ireland could do much more um, and the potential that the agri sector can remain diverse. But I'm going to bring Philip in, if that's okay as well, to maybe just cover that yeah. off. 
Of course, thank you, Claire. And it's just to add on to your point in terms of the CCC advice, we think there's opportunities there in terms of further ambition, for example, in peatland restoration by an earlier date and quicker and faster, which would help to, to deliver and avoidance in emissions. There's also opportunities to maybe increase ambition in terms of woodland expansion. I would say as well, in terms of a pathway, it is robust and it is one, but there are other organizations that are looking at other scenarios in terms of land use and land use change. And as Claire mentioned there, agroecology is a potential route that could be taken. So the Food Farming and Countryside Commission have looked into that and tried to assess how we can feed the UK population with a healthy, sustainable diet whilst freeing up land for nature and moving towards a more sustainable farming system. And it looks like it could be possible, but it does require a lot of different changes in how we do things. I would say as well in terms of ambition, Wales initially had a 95% recommended target from the CCC, and that was based on the importance of their agriculture sector in terms of livestock, because again, similar to us, it makes up a big proportion of what their output is. But again, they've moved beyond that, and they've, they've taken that on board, and they have looked at the opportunities and worked with the CCC to get there, and it takes political will to be able to do that. So so Claire, what, what you're say, what you're saying is you, you could see something slightly different set out set out for agriculture in the sense that you expect agriculture to reach at least ninety two percent by twenty fifty. You would be prepared to work with that through the bill. Sorry, Rosemary, the ninety two percent. That was a wheels. Um eighty eighty two percent. It would reduce all greenhouse gases emission by at least 82% by 2050. You would be prepared to work, look, know that there are exceptions and work with those to continue reducing those after 2050. Well, of course, I mean, the, the CCC have given um, a, a, the target of 82%, not as a set target, but as a an achievable ambition. Yes. Also identify that the the GHG impacts of their options are not um, included in that scenario yeah. plan. You know, so they are still missing information because that's due to the lack of robust evidence um, that they can get. You know, so there is other stuff out there. And what our bill and again, our bill is not a it, it's not setting targets on sectors or specifics. You know, or setting dates and deadlines. It's a framework bill to set carbon action plans or sorry, climate action plans for Northern Ireland. You know, uh, and so these things will progress. And as the CCC have already said as well, as new technologies emerge, as you know, we see the benefits of other sectors and, and other policies um, moving forward, that we're going to be in an ever movable and a shifting landscape. And of course, then Boris Johnson coming out last week um, and changing the um, the UK's target um to what was it 78 percent by 2035 uh -huh. yes claire i i understand that and i take that but can i say that can i just say to you that agriculture within northern ireland is starting at a very different base to agriculture within scotland wales and particularly england for example we're more dependent on on animal agriculture with regard to animals and the reason for that is we do not have the climate to to increase our grain growing uh, to increase our grain growing and arable agriculture which would be more conducive to um, being more supportive of of uh, taking measures towards towards climate change also also we don't have the land mass that England have that they can also reduce, they can increase their, reduce their targets down to 20, 40 or whatever. So I think there's a number of things, number of anomalies specific for Northern Ireland that we need to look into, that needs to be looked into and taken, taken consideration of. Absolutely. And the thing we see there, Rosemary, as well, and I think that with the framework that this bill provides for, and those first initial three years where the executive need to come up with the climate plan, and then the the monitoring of that, you know, those would be the years that hopefully we could start to create baselines and get the real information out there on the full extent um, of what we need to be grappling with in Northern Ireland. So those sectoral plans and those departmental climate action plans that this bill provides for. Will be really important for all those issues that you're raising. 
Um, right. Okay, thank, okay. okay. It's it's just that there is grave concern. There is a lot of concern out there in relation to the agri economy industry. You know, you, you're talking about maybe uh, land use go down by fifty percent. You're talking about uh, farmers losing our farmers losing uh, their method of income by 50 percent and i think that's something your bill needs to include look at methods of um, methods of trying to compensate farmers and compensate the agri industry absolutely and don't forget the knock-on effect then that would have within the economy within your agri within your manufacturing economy and the various other economies associated with it yeah, and that's exactly why the just transition principles is embedded within this bill. You know, so those economic frameworks that those um, the requirement for job creation, the requirement for um, proper wages um, are all in there as well. And I'll maybe hand over to Amanda, if that's OK, to maybe speak to that just transition principle within the bill. F folks, can we just keep the responses a bit more concise, please? Because we're, we're going to end up, uh, we're going to end up running away <laughs> over time and more speakers looking here to ask questions. Go ahead, well, Amanda. I'm happy to provide more evidence if the committee needs yeah. on any issues. Yeah. And just one other thing. Sorry, Amanda. Oh, no, I didn't cut. I didn't mean to cut Amanda off. Sorry, Amanda. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, as Claire's pointed out, the bill really is about ensuring we have a just transition for everybody to move towards a more socio-economically and ecologically sustainable uh, future. The, the concepts of the just transition are deeply embedded in both the Paris Agreement and subsequent international agreements, uh, and reinforced through the Salisha uh, Declaration which is about how do we uh, ensure we have a just transition which creates decent work and quality jobs. Um, and some of colleagues of mine in the, um, the UK-wide COP26 University Network have put together a very interesting paper on what just transition means. And they outlined four dimensions of justice, which is about procedural justice, distrib distributive justice, ensuring that the costs and benefits are shared equally, recognition justice and restorative justice. So that basically it's about how do we create a space to enable all key stakeholders in our society to have an input into shaping our collective future. Uh, and the bill addressed that in certain ways. Claire has earlier talked about how the principles of just transition are embedded throughout the bill consistently. Um, it's concerned with public consultation, aligns with the creating the space for procedural justice that people are involved in and shaping action. There's a, co a focus on distributive uh, justice where we are looking at how resourcing and funding can be directed towards uh, ensuring fairness and equality and transition. So the point that both Claire and, and Rosemary have talked about, how do we compensate farmers? That is inherent to a bill, which is about ensuring a baseline and better quality of life for everybody as we move forward to a just transition. And as Claire's point out, you know, I can provide a more detailed paper on what a just transition looks like, what are its components, but the bill really is about creating that baseline for equality, to uh, reduce inequality, to eliminate poverty and social de deprivation, uh, to support high net zero carbon investment and infrastructure, and create a work that is high value, fair, and sustainable. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, just one last question. You, you spoke about your agreement, with the Paris Agreement. Can, can I just suggest that maybe uh, there's a little bit of conflict in relation to that. You know, the Paris Agreement recognises the importance of safeguarding food security and ending hunger and the particular vulnerabilities of food production systems to the adverse impact of climate change. So is there not a little bit of conflict there with your position? Philip, do you want to come in? Yeah, no problem. And thank you for that question, Rosemary. I think food security is a highly complex issue and one of the big things that impacts individual food security is access to food. We already produce enough food globally to feed the population more than once over. Um, in the future, the biggest threat to food security is going to be climate change and it's going to take a change in how we do things to maintain that capacity at the land, maintain our ability to, to produce food in the long term, and that will require a range of different changes. And the big important thing is ensuring that our natural capital, that underpinning resource in terms of what produces our food and food security is maintained in the long term. I think a push to produce more and more to try and overcome issues with food security can actually have negative implications because it undermines that resource base, which is so crucial for us all. 
Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, and just I want to say, just to I want to declare sort of an interest that one of my party colleagues has one of the co-sponsors of the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move around here to Patsy. Sound on? Yeah. Yes, okay, Patsy. Thank, we thank got you. you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Claire, for come along and being with us here today and your colleagues as well. And that's really informative. And I know Mark, Mark H. Durkin has been a co-sponsor of your bill. So uh, thank you for that. Now, um, I'll maybe just like, if anybody needs a, a wake up about reality, there probably isn't one of us here who hasn't been standing knee deep in water and flash flooding situations that have occurred in housing estates and indeed in areas where there's never been flooding historically before. Um, that's that's a reality, and uh, Chair, you referred to it up in the Glenelly Valley. There, uh, this is having a major impact, and so so anybody that chooses to deny that it's a reality is just living in cloud cuckoo land. Uh, we have a responsibility as as individuals, but we have also a responsibility as an as legislators to to see this through and try and mitigate the the impacts of climate change for the generations in the future ahead. So, uh, it's an onus, it's a responsibility, it's a moral moral duty on us. Uh, for the survival of, of the human race because you have all sorts of things like migrations of population, you have um, uh, forest, uh, forested areas being denuded, you have changes in the land form and land shape in areas where once upon a time they were green and lovely and uh, now are turning into sand. So all these things are happening and uh, Amanda, you referred to the sea levels and that. So th there's no disputing that something has to be done about it. Um, now, I just wanted to tease through some of the aspects of your bill there, please, Claire. Um, now, because, as you know, our own party and uh, with yourselves has been an advocate and a champion for an independent EPA. Um, tell me, just the role of the Climate Commissioner, obviously I'm interested in the role and function of commissioners elsewhere to do a language. So, um, the importance of those roles, the, the responsibilities, the duties, and equally, Rather than just a person who's there to nudge and, and um, encourage, um, any function that that commissioner might have by way of um, ensuring that things are done, right? That's the first thing. But possibly um, in conjunction with an EPA, uh, an independent uh, environmental protection agency, what's the, the tie in there? Because obviously, I'm clearly down the line, I would see a very, very, very obvious one. Uh, if not indeed the merging of the two uh, offices. Um, so if you could maybe just say that, uh, just give us some insights into that as well. And, and two, I, like Rosemary and others here, I represent rural areas uh, where agri-food and farming has been traditionally a big sector. Uh, <clears throat> many of those farmers indeed have got emails this morning about farmers who are scared about your, your private members bill. Uh, now, there are those of us who take a very pragmatic line about that, and that is that farming and those who, who do farming, they're the guardians of the ground, of the earth, and um, they too have a role and responsibility to do that as responsibly as they possibly can. Now, Rosemary was taking us that direction. Um, what I'm looking at, and, and Amanda, you came in briefly on it, is the incentivization of farmers. Now, I'm thinking of afforestation programs so that that balance can be got right between people being incentivized uh, on land use, which improves the environment through the emissions, uh, the positive emissions that are going up into the atmosphere, through programs of environmental land use, um, afforestation is one of them, but one of them, and as we know, we need much, much more afforestation uh, to try and uh, create some sort of a balance uh, for, for our land use. So to reassure those, um, farmers or those associated with the agri-food sector, maybe you have some uh, precedents in other lands, in other countries, in other jurisdictions where that balance is being got right and where the agri-sector, the landowners are buying in firmly into afforestation and environmental enhancement programs too. I think that's very important that we, we look at that as well, please. So thanks, Chair. Thank you, Patsy, for that. Um, and splitting those up into two, I'm going to bring in Anna Rag um, on the nature and roles and responsibilities of the commissioner. And if, with your permission, if it's okay, we'll go to Philip then to address the land use management Great. and the economics behind uh, perhaps new models there. If that's okay. Great. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Patsy, for the question from um, Claire. Um, yeah, the Climate Commissioner has two main functions for this bill. The first is under Clause 4, which is on reporting on the implementation of climate action plans mm -hmm. during the duration of the climate action plans. And the second is under Clause 9, reporting on the effectiveness of the Act itself once, mm -hmm. once it's uh, enacted, uh, and recommending any changes to try and uh, better achieve the net zero target. And those are important functions because, as Claire had mentioned at the start of this session, um, the Assembly has an incredibly important role to play in the Climate Action Plans. Climate Action Plans don't take effect unless the Assembly approves them. And the Assembly can also approve changes in the Climate Action Plan. In order to do that, the Assembly needs um, an independent source of expert evidence. The Assembly needs to be as well informed as possible so it can debate as well as possible uh, whether to approve any changes and whether to approve any climate action plans that are brought forth. So the Climate Commissioner acts as that nodal agency to provide the Assembly with on the ground evidence of what's going right and what's going wrong and what can be improved. Um, secondly, I think it's vitally important for legislation of this kind to be under a sort of constant review, particularly because climate change, as we know, um, isn't a static phenomenon. It, it keeps fluctuating and the science keeps evolving and the technology keeps evolving. Um, and indeed, the damage might keep worsening. Uh, at some point in the future. So it's vitally important that this legislation is kept under review and the Climate Commissioner therefore makes these recommendations to see how we can improve on the pathways available to get to net zero, um, at which actions need to be taken uh, at, at what point in time. Um, just sort of very briefly on the enforcement question, um, the Climate Commissioner doesn't have enforcement powers. Uh, and there's a reason for that, because the executive and the assembly working together within this bill provide the key sort of drivers for climate policy in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. And so because the assembly has sanctioning powers under the Northern Ireland Act, for example, um, it's vitally important that this process be done as democratically as possible and as transparently as possible and having an enforcement authority to sort of stand over the heads of the assembly and the executive um, wasn't, we didn't feel it would be appropriate to have that sort of sanctions regime, particularly when the assembly can have uh, sanctions if it wishes. So that's why the climate commissioner doesn't have specific enforcement powers under the, uh, under okay. the I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. I, I'm just taking over the chair briefly. Uh, I'm just uh, with two more questions, William and Harry. That we're just for everybody's benefit. We're already on 25 minutes late, so can I ask both the questioners and those giving the answers just if they can be as brief as possible? Okay, William, you're next. Sorry, Chair. Was there? Was, I think there was one or, one or two aspects of my question weren't uh, weren't answered. And yeah. that was nobody had intentionally not answered them, it's just we're, we're in the interregnum period between yourself and Declan there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fair enough. I'll allow you to don't be sorry to answer them before moving on to William. No, you yeah. can't go over it. No. Um, what I was going to say was just that, that aspect of incentivization, of encouragement, or if there are other areas or example, examples you can give us where farming, agri-food, work very closely with environmental interests, with government, on a common pathway. Um, that's that's the sort of thing that, that, that I'm looking at. If there are precedents elsewhere, please just. Yeah, I'll, I'll come in on that one. Thank you, Patsy. So right, I, I think, I think uh, incentivization is going to be key and enabling a transition in terms of how we farm and manage our land is going to be absolutely crucial. Like we can't meet the climate or address the climate crisis without farmers and land managers. And they're mm -hmm. the only sector that have the capability to store and sequester carbon. So I think it's part of a big transition that's going to take a lot of investment and um, knowledge and skills and advice to kind of go there to incorporate nature businesses. 
And I think there's benefits for farm businesses in terms of doing that as well. So it can make, um, say, for example, in terms of shelter for livestock or producing wind breaks, all yeah. those sorts of things that provide uh, soil health as well, that provide benefits to farmers. Yeah. In terms of examples elsewhere, I suppose we do have some good examples here in terms of um, advice to farmers through previous agri-environment schemes where farmers have delivered quite a lot for nature and for climate in terms of restoring peatland or managing species rich grasslands. Mm -hmm. Further away, I would say we could look at France as an example, who have put forward a roadmap to a transition to agroecology and they've invested a lot of research and a lot of money into upskilling farmers, looking at farmers <laughs> A different way in terms of producing food and delivering those climate impacts. They've set targets in terms of soil carbon and how they can store that mm -hmm. and increase that. I think that's going to be really, really key. And I think we need that that investment here to deliver that and that long term direction of travel and policy is going to be really important to do that. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, Philip. Okay, happy enough, Patsy. Thank you. Thank okay. You. William, you're next. Oh okay, got now. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. And uh, my question to Claire is, uh, I have a number of questions actually too, but in relation to the Climate Change Committee under Lord uh, Devon, uh, they made a recommendation. Uh, and then in their letter to the Minister, I, I, I'm going to read a paragraph or two, just quick ones. In every scenario, scenario for achieving UK net zero that we have constructed, Northern Ireland would not get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 in every scenario that they've looked at. And they, and they also say that an 82% reduction of greenhouse gases in Northern Ireland represents equivalent, an equivalent effort and a fair contribution to the net zero target. They also say to go forward on that substantial reduction in output from Northern Ireland livestock farming sector that goes beyond even the more stretching scenarios we have all made. Do you clear accept the findings of Lord Devon's Climate Change Committee. Thanks, William. Um, and yes, sir, I was present at the committee when they came and presented to us. You know, and when I spoke to Lord Devon about this, he, you know, encouraged us to be more ambitious. You know, he said they would welcome if Northern Ireland wanted to be more ambitious. And I think a large part of what you're asking, I hopefully, have maybe raised in previous answers in terms of what the see. CCC have said that they haven't taken into account um, GHG emissions in Northern Ireland simply because the baselines weren't there as well. So there's a lot to be looked at. I mean, I would never dismiss anybody's expert advice, um, but there are other reports out there. There are other bodies out there. We named three in this bill, and it's that shifting sands that's going to happen. It's that speeding up of delivery that's going to happen as well. Um, so this framework bill is about pulling that together and doing the best that we can for Northern Ireland. So I'm not dismissing anybody's expert opinion. I'm not dismissing the work that has been put in. We want to go further now and create all evidence in order to make sustainable and appropriate decisions. Against against a committee's clear advice. Now, can I say... Uh, North sorry, North it's, it's as well as, William, not against, sorry. Well, there's, there's a big difference in what your ask is and what your bill is asking and what they're recommending. There's a vast difference. So you have to accept that. Well, uh, they also point out where they haven't um, brought evidence and, and baselines in as well. Um, and they also say that as new evidence on climate science behaviours or low carbon technologies emerges, and or the UK's international climate commitments change, it may be prudent to tighten a 2050 target in Northern Ireland, for example. They also say that, you know, and again, Northern Ireland's climate legislation should allow for reductions to go beyond our current assessments. So they're encouraging us, they're telling us to go beyond the current assessments. And that's what we're trying to do within this bill. And we'll continue to work with them on that, of course. And, and they're saying, you know, the well, I mean, is at least an 82% reduction. I'm going to make it either read that paragraph again. In every scenario for achieving UK net zero that we have constructed, Northern Ireland would not get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions for 2050. In every scenario that they have looked at. Yep. So I have to make clear, I think. Now, if we in Northern Ireland have to reduce food, agri-food production, reduce jobs, jobs massively would be lost. The, the outcome of that is 
in, in essence is that food coming into the UK will be imported from other regions or other countries like Brazil who's cutting down rainforests that contribute massively to global warming when our contribution is very small in regard. Now we, I think we all have to accept that we need to get our act together and, and reduce emissions and we all want to. And, and the agri, agri sector wants to help and do that. But do you accept to do that? Would that be a wise thing to do to, to reduce our food production in Northern Ireland and import from other countries that are contributing much more, much more, like massively compared to Northern Ireland? So, uh, for, for, uh, I think we just used the, the example during the COVID crisis when we've seen imports, I think it was of beef coming in from Poland, and the minister moved very, very swiftly to, you know, to try and redress that one. So, that's just one maybe example of how fast we can move to prevent that happening. But for dairy, and for example, most of the places that could increase production are in Western Europe or in New Zealand, places that already have very stringent environmental legislation. And for meat, the risk is slightly greater, yep. Um, however, we have a responsibility as a developed nation to act and to do our best rather than joining Brazil in a race to the bottom. Um, and the leaky drift risk can really be a, a, addressed by differentiating Northern Ireland products based on quality and environmental credentials. So there will be opportunities for agriculture sector here to achieve net zero in terms of how we can market Northern Ireland produced dairy and meat at a global level. So rather than challenging us in a race to the bottom, um, you know, and we all know what trade deals might and might not be bringing in the future, but you know, we have good quality standards here. Let's keep that market. Let's build a, a pride around that one, and um, let's not allow. And I can't imagine any minister in Northern Ireland um, allowing that to happen either. And I think that recent example is testament to that. Yeah, but clearly, clearly, we're told from the experts that if, if we go as far as your bill as, as states, we have, there has to be a substantial reduction in, our, in livestock in Northern Ireland. That is something. That is a, 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 an effect that passes on into the agri-food sector to jobs. I mean, that is a wide-ranging effect that I think needs looked at. Has your uh, bill looked at rural needs? Has it had a real needs assessment that been carried out in relation to your bill? And has there been an, Im, an, an economic impact assessment done carried out in relation to your bill? And I'm going to bring in Amanda on that one with the rural needs, if that's okay with you. Thanks very much, um, Claire and William. Um, through our intensive uh, engagement process with our members, we've been very conscious of, of the need to consider rural communities and urban communities as we look about climate action. The bill itself will mandate consideration of different communities and sectors and their needs in the formation of climate action plans. So we are very conscious of the particular needs of different communities and that will be mandated, mandated further through the development of climate action plans. So yeah, yes, we, we've been focused on that and we'll continue to focus on it as a bill uh, following its enactment and, and subsequent climate action plans. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Okay, Harry. Uh, that's me. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate it. And well, thank you, Claire. Claire, um, I have serious concerns about this bill. I mean, farms are for producing food, so if they produce less, where will the food come from to feed us, firstly? Um, what do we export? Where will that export shortfall come from? Is this not just moving the concern you have elsewhere? I can't see how reducing agri-production will help look after our world and feed our and other people in it. Like, I do believe there's a bigger picture there, Claire, that we need to look at, but I do understand there's always been climate change, and I do feel we're conscious of that and we're happy to address it, but not to the extent of causing food shortage or poverty. I think we need to keep people healthy as we can, but uh, I'm not sure if this is the way to do it. Uh, I know recently the Minister has introduced uh, Forest for a Future and Green Growth Strategy, and you all are aware there's lots more to come. Um, I will wait until I see what he brings forward. Thank you, Claire. Thanks for that, Harry. And I can't imagine anybody in Northern Ireland will go hungry. I mean, you know, we have a population of 1.8 million people in Northern Ireland and producing enough food to, to, to feed 10 million. 
Um, and in terms of export markets, I think we're heading into Brexit territory there in the remit of the UK government. But I'm going to bring in Philip, if that's OK. Thank you, Claire. Uh, thanks for that question. All right. That's a complex issue. But one, of the, one of the things that has been recommended through a number of reports and from the CCC itself is a role that dietary change can play in terms of delivering climate ambition and also in contributing towards public health as well. So we actually, across the UK, consume probably double the amount of animal protein that's recommended. And that's delivering those negative health implications in terms of diet-related ill health and costs. So there's a public health benefit in going towards a less but better approach to livestock production. There's always going to be a need for livestock production here. It's going to be really key in terms of nutrient cycling, in terms of managing our land for nature, in terms of contributing to carbon storage in some places as well. But we need to move towards, suppose, a more sustainable system. And I think the reduction in output doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing for a farm business. So if you reduce output in line with the land's natural carrying capacity, it reduces your input costs, makes your business more sustainable and more robust. And we're starting to see examples of farmers who are already doing that in Northern Ireland and they're becoming more profitable as a result. I think there's opportunities with this less but better approach to really market ourselves and say, look, we're contributing towards net zero. We have the highest standards globally that you could ever look at and we're delivering health outcomes as well. And I think that's the way we need to go. And this is the way farming systems across the world need to go as well. Okay, thanks for your answer, Phil. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Uh, thank, thank you, Phil. Um, okay, members, um, um, I want to take this opportunity to uh, thank the representatives uh, for attending here this morning. Uh, and we, we will be heavily engaged in the scrutiny of this bill for the next uh, number of months. And no doubt we'll be revisiting some of the, all of the themes that were raised today. So thank you very much. And uh, I understand, Claire, that you'll now rejoin us as a member of the committee. I'll do my best. Stay in a minute. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. <laughs> OK, members, um, we're going to move on now to the next item on the agenda, which is an oral evidence session in Belfast City Council and Newry Morn and Down District Councils on the withdrawal of DERA and local authority staff from the ports. I want to refer members to the briefing paper from Belfast County City Council at page 76, Newry Morning Down briefing paper at page 87, and further clarification from the PSNA on the telephone call received by the Sunday World at page 88. I want to welcome by Starleaf, Mrs Suzanne Wiley, Chief Executive of Belfast City Council, Ms Siobhan Tolan, Director of City Services Belfast City Council, and Ms Marie Ward, the Chief Executive of Newry Morn uh, District Council. Uh, I want to invite the council representatives to brief the committee. Okay, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, committee. Um, if I just introduce myself, Suzanne Wiley, Chief Executive of Belfast City Council, and I'm joined um, here this morning by Siobhan Toland, who is the Director of City and Neighbourhood Services um, in Belfast City Council. I'll let Marie do her introductions as well. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Chair. Marie Ward, I'm the Chief Executive of Newry Morning Down Council, and I'm joined this morning by Owen Devlin, the Assistant Director of Health and Wellbeing, with responsibility for environmental health. Thank so, you. Chair, with your indulgence, if you're content, um, I think both Marie and, and ourselves um, have um, a quick presentation um, to make, a verbal presentation to make to you, which summarises uh, the written evidence that's already been submitted to the committee. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, All right. Perfect. So, yeah, yeah. thank you. I'll start then. So, um, as you're aware, um, the committee invited both um, of uh, our councils um, into uh, give evidence to you uh, this morning as part of your scrutiny um, that you're undertaking on the decisions by Dara and the New South Council to withdraw staff on the 1st of February from po uh, points of entry. Um, border, border control posts. So um, we have considered your terms of reference, you'd be glad to know, and the information that you've already received um, through the various sessions that you've held so far. And so this opening statement is really set out um, in that context. Um, so as I said, it referred to the written submission and it provides a very detailed timeline around decision making uh, that Belfast City Council took in relation to its port 
health inspections over that period of time. This council um, provides well over 90 different services um, of, of a wide range and has over 2,700 staff. And my members and uh, management team and I, you, you would expect, of course, that we take health and safety of our staff very, very seriously indeed. And we have over the years as a council had to deal with a, a wide range of contentious issues. Uh, and we always consider staff safety as the primary issue when we are assessing any potential threat or safety concern, along with any other information uh, that we have and how that impacts on service delivery. So consequently, we have over those years built up an extremely good relationship with PSNI in terms of their threat assessment processes and their communication procedures. And we take that into account uh, when making these difficult decisions. So going to, to Belfast Port, in the written submission, I would draw your attention to the site map um, so that you get an overview of the location and the environment in which Belfast City Council staff actually work. And at the time in question, we, um, we had 20 BCC employed uh, staff uh, at uh, the port. Um, who were carrying out documentary checks, identity checks and, and physical checks, and they were working on a shift basis. And these staff are housed within Quarry Place. That's shown on the map in your uh, appendix on the, the written submission. Um, and they also carry out their physical checks within that compound. This is a dedicated compound to Belfast City Council uh, staff. Um, and they do that for, both for goods from third countries and for goods uh, from GB. And in relation to goods from GB, they are reliant on the Dara staff, who are located in a different location uh, in Belfast Harbour, and you can see that located on your map, map as well. And what happens is that uh, when the lorries come off uh, the ferries, um, they are then um, uh, directed by the Dara staff if they are required to have an inspection by BCC staff, they are directed to Corrie Place. And a risk assessment, of course, is in place for all of our staff at Corrie Place, as is required by law. So as you can see, Corrie Place is inside a controlled area with barriers and also with CCTV. And the harbour also has a dedicated police service, um, uh, which was alert to the community tension being reported and obviously works very closely with the PSNI. So just so you understand um, the written um, evidence as well and who's involved in that written evidence who we're referring to, uh, the chain of command for the service itself includes the director represented here uh, today, the city protection manager and port health manager. And of course, as you're already aware, during the last two weeks of January 2021, a number of press reports showed intimidating graffiti relating to border post staff, which appeared in the Lauren area. And this was picked up by the director, Siobhan, here, um, and by the port management team who engaged in communications with DERA, uh, their veterinary service, and uh, the Harbour Police. Both organisations were unaware at that stage of any specific concerns relating to Belfast Port. But the Harbour Police did at that time agree to provide some additional patrols and to call into the Corrie Place unit uh, to assist our staff with any additional um, security concerns or, or measures that they would wish to see put in place. Um, and this was done for assurance purposes. Chair and myself also attended a sort of subgroup meeting um, known as the EU uh, Exit Past and Finished Working Group on the 28th of January, which is chaired by the uh, uh, Chief Executive from the Mid-East Antrim Council, and at which the veterinary uh, officer, Chief Veterinary Officer, I should say, and the Chair did discuss the re recent graffiti, primarily in respect of Lauren Port. Um, and the issues were further discussed in relation to Lauren Port the following day at a DERA multi-agency update meeting, again attended by two of my staff. Then on Friday 29th of January, you'll be aware that news broke about the EU's initial stance on vaccines and uh, political tensions uh, increased. More graffiti did appear in Belfast, but we found no evidence of any of that graffiti in Belfast making overt threats to staff at Belfast Port. It related really primarily to uh, calls for an Irish sea border and some of it being criticised political parties. I was then alerted to the issue uh, on Sunday the 31st of January when I was contacted by the DERA Minister on my mobile phone at 9.30pm 
Um, and he wanted to bring my attention to what he described as escalating community tensions, referring to the graffiti which had appeared in Larne and expressing his, his serious concerns for staff at the ports. He also said he had talked to the uh, chief executive of Ms. Samtron that weekend that she'd also expressed serious concerns. So after that, what, during that call, I agreed to investigate the issues uh, locally in terms of the City Council and its staff. And what I did was early the next morning, I discussed the issue with the directors of city services, and I also contacted the chief executive of Ms. Samtron. And then various community communications took place. Um, between my staff, um, the port staff managers, the Harbour Police and the PSNI and DERA. And the PSNI, through various sources, advised that their information indicated that there were no specific security issues identified in respect of the Belfast City Council staff and our, and our staff, site and our staff at that time. Um, they also did say that for insurance purposes, they would increase patrols along with the Harbour Police uh, and that they would immediately contact me and any staff um, if any specific threat issues arose in the normal way that had been agreed previously. Um, I did attend a remote meeting then later on that day, which was hosted by the Chief Executive of Mid East Antrim uh, at 4.45pm. And that meeting was attended by the Deira Minister um, and various Deira officials, including the Permanent Secretary, uh, and the Chief Executive of the Food Sandwich Agency. Both the Minister and the Chief Executive of Middle East Antrim expressed their serious concerns at that meeting about the level of community tension and also highlighted, highlighted the extent of the threatening graffiti um, which had appeared in Larne and also um, talked about reports of surveillance of cars at Larne Port and mentioned another unspecified issue of significant concern which had been reported through anonymous channel channels. The Chief Executive of Midney Sandrum also highlighted that the party leaders in Midney Sandrum had been alerted to these issues and were reminded to take action to withdraw staff, but that, that that would be further discussed at their council meeting later that evening. So following the meeting, um, uh, at 4.45, I spoke for a second time that day to the Belfast PSNI commander and I relayed the information to him on the concerns which had been raised with me um, in that virtual meeting. He once again stated that the PSNI view was that there was no organised or credible threat to Belfast City Council staff and that I would be contacted immediately if that situation changed. He asked that I would speak to ICC McEwen as he had been discussing the same issue with other partners. However, I had to attend a City Council uh, meeting myself that evening um, as well, and it began at 6 p.m. and went on well until after 11 p.m., as some of our meetings tend to do here in Belfast. Um, so it was 8 a.m. the next morning when I spoke to ACC McCune, and he reiterated the police position that I had been informed of the night before. I asked for a written threat assessment, and this was reiterated uh, the following day, along with the Chief Executive of Mid East Antrim at a PSNI hosted partners meeting, and that was on the 2nd of February. On the evening of the 1st of February, during the Council meeting, it became apparent that um, Mid East Antrim had taken the decision to withdraw its staff from Lauren Port, and that was then followed later by an announcement from the Deira Minister that Deira Port staff were also being withdrawn. At that stage, we were still in um, session at, at Council. But in the background, the Director of City Services was in close contact with the Port Health Manager. And on hearing the news of the withdrawals, the manager took the decision to ask our staff, as a precaution, to focus on office duties and to temporarily pause physical checks until more information was available. So then over the following days, the PSNI continued to provide assurances around the threat level assessed uh, with numerous meetings and the written uh, threat assessment was formally received on the 4th of February. Ongoing discussions took place um, with our staff, trade unions and also with other agencies. And a special meeting of the Belfast Party Group Leaders meeting was called on the 2nd of February at which they agreed that the pragmatic approach taken at Belfast Port was appropriate after taking into consideration the PSNI assessment of the threat 
level being low and not organised, and also the security measures that were in place at Corey Place itself. Safety staff, of course, um, as you uh, as you would um, imagine, has since been kept under constant review with updates um, to uh, my staff at, port, uh, at the port um, and also updates to the risk assessment with additional precautionary security measures um, being put in place. And it did transpire that whilst BCC port staff could and did carry out physical inspections on third country consignments from the 2nd of February again, it wasn't possible for them to resume physical checks in GB consignments until the 10th of February because of their reliance on failed staff. I would also take the opportunity to highlight to the committee concerns that have been raised by me and others across local government with partner agencies and departments which will need to be resolved um, to allow us to effectively perform our statutory functions uh, after the end of the, the grace period um, for refueling consignment. These concerns relate, relate to finance and resources for this work shared data management and systems, and also to infection facilities. Thank you very much, members. I'll hand over to Marie. Okay. Um, so, Chair, okay, if Marie. you're okay then, just um, yep. following on from Suzanne, um, I suppose uh, you have the, the written submission from Newry Morn and Down, um, and just to set out four members, um, Newry Morn and Down um, only took on responsibility um, for the um, food inspection uh, after the 31st of December 2020. Prior to that, um, there was no EU approved BCP within the district, um, so it was only after the 31st of December we took that responsibility. Um, the Council works very closely with the Food Standards Agency and DERA to undertake the role um, and at an operational level that requires the Council staff to engage and work closely with staff, um, DERA staff and um, the staff located in the temporary inspection facility in Warren Point Port. Um, it's, it's important also to highlight that Warren Point Port has a low throughput um, with only two sailings from Haitian to Warren Point on average per day which carry goods which may require checks. Um, and the council put in place a team of staff from internal and external recruitment processes who have been working in Warm Point Port since the 3rd of January 2021. The staff complement um, within this um, service is uh, three and a half full-time equivalent environmental health officers, one senior environmental health officer on shift, um, and five environmental health officers trained and providing standby cover. Um, it's not a 24-hour service. It covers two shifts, which operate from 4:30 a.m. to 12:30 p.m. and 1:30 p.m. to 10:30 p.m. The facilities at Warm Point Port um, are situated within the confines of the controlled area of the port and are not visible from the outside of the port boundary. CCTV is in place within the controlled area of the port. So, on the 1st of February 2021, quite late in the evening, we became aware through news reports. Um, of the withdrawal of staff from SPS checks at the point of entry border control post at Larne. Newry Morn and Down Council staff um, continued to work at that port of entry border control post at one point throughout the, the period. On the evening of the 1st of February, Newry Morn and Down Council officials made contact with colleagues at Belfast City Council and Mid and East Antrim Borough Council um, to establish if their staff were withdrawn from the ports. Um, the initial action taken by Newry Morn and Down District Council was to contact the one staff member who was due to attend shift at 4.30 a.m. that morning and ask that they work from home um, as a precautionary measure. This was quite late in the evening and the staff member did not receive and did not check the phone until they had actually arrived at the port at 7.30 a.m. the next morning and commenced work. The dearest staff member due to work in Warren Point Port was also in attendance at 4.30 a.m. Subsequent to the decision to ask the member of staff to, um, to work from home for that short period of time between 4.30 and 7.30 um, that evening, um, I, contact was made with PSNI locally to establish if there was an increased risk to staff attending the point of entry border control post at Warm Point um, Port. And we were informed that there was no information or intelligence available at that time to suggest there was any risk or threat to staff at the port of Warm Point. So following discussions with the Assistant Director of Health and Wellbeing, the Head of Environmental Health Commercial and the Safety Health and Emergency Planning Manager, the decision was made that staff would not be withdrawn from duties at the port.
Staff were fully briefed and reassured by myself as Chief Executive on the available information and decision made in keeping staff at the port. They were given the opportunity to ask questions and raise concerns um, at the meeting with myself and also with their line managers on an ongoing, ba ongoing basis. A meeting was held with Party Leaders Forum of Newry Morning Town Council on the evening of the 2nd of February to brief um, on the situation and um, they were content with the actions that have been taken. Health and safety risk assessments in relation to personal safety um, were reviewed and updated. Um, and although through um, continued engagement with the PSNI, the Council were informed that the threat assessments remained low, control measures were implemented to provide additional assurance to staff. These additional measures were agreed and implemented in partnership with the PSNI, DERA and Warm Point Harbour Authority and included increased controls by the PSNI at staff start and finish times of the shifts. PSNI spoke with the staff and provided reassurance advice and contact numbers. There was a new procedure for staff to remove and put it on council and port branded clothing and high-vis PPE once inside the port boundary. And Warm Point Harbour Security also increased surveillance inside the port at start and finish times of shifts. Spaces for car parking within the controlled area of the port were identified and made available to both DERA and council staff. Newry Morn and Down Council continue to attend the SKYS meetings with PSNI, DERA and council colleagues, um, where we are informed of the status of the threat assessment and can continue to keep any risk of staff um, under review. Like Suzanne, I would just like to highlight that there are issues that we, we do continue to raise in relation to finance and resources, shared data and the temporary facilities that need to be resolved to ensure that we can continue to deliver this service. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I'm going to just move straight around the room uh, to members. The number of members have indicated they want to ask a question. And the first on my list is Patsy. Uh, thanks very much indeed for giving up your time. I know you're all very, very busy people uh, with other duties that you have to contend with at the moment. And uh, But if I could just, uh, first of all, just in the interest of, of I suppose, correctness, um, this uh, EU exit, is it a task and force working group or a task and finish working group? I just want to get the terminology right. Um, Chair, as far as I know, it's a, a task and finish working group. I know it has been referred to in correspondence, which we have now received as task and force working group. Uh, now just, this is a solace working group, is it? Yes. That is correct. And um, that is it, now just so I'm just by way of information, what what's it supposed to do? There's what's its purpose? What's its benefit? And um, so I have uh, the uh, the draft terms of reference here for um, the EU task and finish group. So it is titled task right. and finish group. Right. Um, and so the terms of reference, which I think you've probably already written to Solus to get a copy of, and I know that that will be um, provided. Right. That's okay, that's good enough for that made it to yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. But obviously they are to look at the, the issues um, from EU exit impacting on local government um, yes. and in particular the port um, health issues. Ah, great. Great. Now, that, thank you for clarifying that to me. And now, um, as you know, we have it has been presented to us that. Um, the Chief Executive of Midland East Anthem Borough Council was acting in a solace role. Um, could you tell me just um, what would I would expect that in representing Northern Ireland, as that titular uh, post seems to do, that uh, you would have been consulted prior to any uh, correspondence being made, especially to the Cabinet Office, but to anyone uh, using that title, um, to establish what difficulties or problems or issues you may be encountering um, was there any consultation done prior to issue of that letter with either of your two councils? Um, I let her speak for herself. But, um, I think um, in relation to um, that particular letter that you refer to, um, no, there was no consultation. Okay. Um, I have a very, very busy time for all of us, I have to say. Well, I, get all that, I get all that, but it was representing uh, or whether it was presented to us as representing uh, local authorities. So, and Nuri and Moore, I presume that didn't happen either. Maybe that's her own presumption. Sure, no, as, as Suzanne said, we weren't, um, I, I wasn't consulted on that. Um, okay, letter. thank you. Now, uh, can I maybe just ask very briefly, did anyone from the Cabinet Office contact either of your two councils around these matters or matters related? 
Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware yeah. of. But this, well, could you maybe just uh, clarify for us? Uh, I know not not that you're aware of, but just to be precise, if, if you don't know just at the moment, if you could just clarify that for us, please, just uh, if because you never know when an email was sent in or whatever. We just want to get completeness and accuracy. Just whenever we're working our way through this, if you don't mind, please just. Um, don't mean now, you mean if you can just check it out, please. Um, now, an issue has been made and has been referred to us, and again, I want to clarify this, and uh, I've seen there that, um, that, from my perception of the evidence, the written evidence that you presented to us, that things seem to have been okay, but did you experience any difficulty over this period of heightened attention or learning? in contact with the PSNI, or indeed, uh, I see reference there to the, the Harbour Police in Belfast. Uh, did, likewise, did they maintain regular contact with yourselves at senior or other levels? Um, from a Belfast perspective, we didn't have any difficulty contacting them or receiving information from them. Um, we, did, we weren't, however, involved in their Skies partnership meetings or Gold Command meetings um, in advance of at the of February. But there wasn't any contact in, there wasn't any problem in contacting or any difficulties or any problems with the flow of information from either the Harbour Police or the PSNI in both your cases? No, no. And Chair, from a nearly morning down perspective, no, there was no issues contacting our local PSNI, but again, we weren't involved in the Skies or Gold Command um, meetings. That's okay, thank you. Now, um, and then likewise with DERA, um, the department, uh, did they maintain regular contact with yourselves uh, too at, uh, at a senior level as well? They did. I let Siobhan yeah. speak as well because she would have been the one in contact with them. Okay. So, the Chair, um, the DERA had an operational through readiness uh, stand up meeting, which they were at one point uh, operating most mornings and then it moved to two or three mornings a week. So. That's where we got sort of a, a round robin of all the partner agencies <laughs> operations and they were running that week of the 23rd to the, the, the 25th of, of January, the week preceding and the week after, so that they continued to, to operate. Um, so, so yes, we had regular contact through that structure um, and operationally on the ground, a very strong contact uh, with, with your uh, officers. That, that's, that's good to hear. Um, just if I could maybe take you on to, um, oh sorry, one other thing, then what, what is, um, I'm asking from a pure basis of ignorance of the, the, the mechanism for doing this, but what would be your structure or your uh, channel of communication with EU officials? Right, uh, well, that was mostly arranged through those their stand up meetings. Uh, uh, the Chief Veterinary Officer attended those as well, and he would have been uh, coordinating the visits from EU officials. I'm aware that, for instance, um, the EU official uh, that was in inspecting Belfast, Corey Pace Court, uh, on the Friday preceding uh, the 25th of January, so they had a full day in with our team. So, but that communication would have come down through Dara, through 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 Robert and his his staff. Um, similar with you, with Nuri and Morn, yes. Uh -huh. So Nuri Morn and Down again, similar to Belfast. Um, we would have had regular contact operationally with okay. Dara, and, and we work very closely with Dara officials on a daily basis. And again, contact through the chief veterinary officer. Well, that's good to hear, as I would expect, indeed, from, from that same person. Um, um, now, just, I want to just move you on to uh, protocols or uh, practices. Um, you're both, uh, you're, all of you, I should say, but specifically the chief executives, are chief executives of, of big local authorities with uh, multiple parties and indeed maybe one or two independents on them as well. Um, just, you, you've read the letter that... Um, Ms. Donaghy, the Chief Executive of uh, Midden East Antrim Borough Council, has written, um, I'm not quite sure in what role, but ostensibly she said to us that it was acting in her capacity as, as a solace representative, but she has signed it as the Chief Executive of the local authority. Um, would it be practice for yourselves, given that it has quite a number of um, interesting views, some of would venture uh, go down the political route, but would it be the case that um, both of you as chief executives, uh, given that there would be differences of opinion and differences of emphases, 
Um, would it be a protocol or procedure to run that across either a full council meeting, given that it is such a major issue of content, contention and indeed differing views, to either run that across your full council meeting uh, to establish if in fact uh, the true view was being represented on behalf of the, the local authority, or run it across the normal mechanisms, which I presume you have, of um, collegiate group leaders uh, of those political parties um, before venturing into what is a, a very a sensitive and contentious area, some of it drawing into the party political. Chair, if I, I just um, on, come in from the New York Morning Down perspective um, first. Um, so we uh, hold, we in New York Morning Down set up a Brexit forum of political representatives um, back a couple of years ago, probably. I, I would need to look back to see the detail of that. And that has a makeup of the various different political representatives. We tend to um, uh, meet to discuss any key issues around Brexit um, through that forum. And then that goes through our uh, Enterprise Regeneration and Tourism Committee and then subsequently to Council. So that's how we have been managing Brexit related matters. And likewise, likewise in Belfast, um, we have a Brexit Committee, which is a formally established um, okay. here in Belfast City Council. Um, and uh, then any decisions that relate to um, resources or overall um, position of the council um, would go through the Strategic Policy and Resources Committee and then be ratified by the council. And that doesn't mean to say that operational letters um, can't be written by the chief executive or by their senior team. And if there are operational issues, of course, that can happen. Yes, on operational, operational issues, I appreciate that, and I do, I do operational and resource, but uh, where this one here is, uh, how should we put it, straying into a major area of concern, of indeed international concern. Um, I, I presume there are protocols, there are procedures that you follow uh, whenever it's your judgment call, but there are procedures that you adhere to and protocols that you adhere to to establish that in fact you are correctly reflecting the professionally as you would uh, the, the entire view of the council. Okay. Um... Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Uh, that, that's me. Thank uh, you. Roger. or John. John. Chair, th thank you. Can, can I thank both chief executives and their respective teams for the information provided? And I think it's it's worth it, Chair, to, to acknowledge to the uh, chief executives that we are, as committee members, mindful that this has been a very challenging year for council staff at all levels and in all areas. And a very challenging year on a number of fronts, um, and we thank them for their efforts in, in, in difficult times. Um, my, my questions, and there are three of them, um, should be relatively brief because we, we've touched on some of the issues. But can I ask both Maria and Susanna, uh, please? Um, it appears to me from, from their presentation and the information given that they're both entirely satisfied with police information provided and with police responses to any queries. Would that be the case? Yes, that would be the case, and that, that happened as a result of um, discussions at numerous levels um, with PSNI from a Belfast perspective. Yeah. So with me being um, involved in some of those discussions directly, um, but also my staff and team and, and, and for emergency planning protocols as well. Mm -hmm. And, and sure, that would be the same for New York Morning Down. There have been lo local um, discussions with PSNI, with myself, um, and then obviously through the um, Sky's formal structure. So. Thank you both for that. I should declare here that I'm a member also of the Northern Ireland Policing Board, so, so it's good news to hear that and probably best that I inform you of my role on that, on that body as well. Um, if, I, if I could turn now to the SOLAS issue, um, and I, I'm satisfied that the correspondence, which took up a considerable amount of time at our, at our previous meeting, um, dated the 31st of January, doesn't mention on any of its seven pages SOLAS as an organisation. I'm absolutely satisfied that that's the case. But can I ask you for you both for clarification? It seems to me um, that as far as you're concerned, there was no solace correspondence um, that chief executives got sight of either before or after the uh, 31st of January. And I refer to any solace correspondence that um, referred to problems around EU exit or management of ports. Um, so, if I can come in there first of all, um, certainly in relation to the letter to the Cabinet Office, I think we've already addressed that, but 
neither Marine himself was aware yeah. of that particular um, correspondence. Um, there had been previous correspondence um, issued to um, it, the um, Food Standards Agency and I believe um, DERA as well, which had been copied to the chair of, of okay. SOLA. Yeah, and that would be normal process that the, that be, the other SOLA participants would see the correspondence? Yes. Yeah. Um, or it would be copied to the chair. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay. And, and finally, um, and I'm not, uh, I must make clear, expecting that, that you can answer for the actions of others, of course, but it seems to me that, that you have a very clear timeline of events and correspondence and meetings and consultations with the police and others, and, and it really does pre present a, a clear picture of, of events. But it seems that there was a flurry of activity in and around the 1st of February, culminating in, in decisions taken that evening. Um, would it be fair to say that most of the events of the day of the 1st of February were driven by the department at ministerial level and also by Midland East Antrim Council? And, and, and that some of you had to react and respond to that? I probably should have clarified that. Yeah, I think what I would say, Chair, is that um, that clearly over that weekend, um, we were aware of you know what I said in, in my presentation um, that tensions um, were um, rising. Certain political tensions were rising over that weekend, um, uh, given um, the uh, stance of um, the EU, uh, and um, we were aware of some additional graffiti going up around Belfast. But as I said, it wasn't directed at the staff per se. Um, uh, on the 1st of, of February, certainly um, the uh, concerns um, that came from both um, the Deere Minister and from um, the East Antrim um, were, um, you know, very, um, were, were concerning um, uh, to us, which is why then we um, raised those with the PFNI again to check out what the position was in terms of their threat assessment um, in relation to Belfast. And, and I'm sure Marie can speak to her for herself in, in yeah. relation to one point. Yeah, and, and Chair, from an Eury Morning Down perspective, I would say it was through the media reports that came out quite late that evening. Um, I, I could be wrong in saying it was possibly the 10 o'clock news um, that, that drew our attention on social media. Um, and that's when we started um, to, I suppose, make some calls and, and do some assessments just to go hard in our own staff. Okay, so thank, thank you both for that. Thank you, John. Uh, Harry? Okay. Thank you, Chair. Got me on. Appreciate it. I'm going to be a wee bit biased and direct my question towards Nuri. Um, firstly, good to see you again, Marie and Owen. I'm sorry I could not be in person. I had the privilege of working with Marie and Nuri Morning Down Council for a good few years. So thankfully, Marie, you could just continue to work as pretty much normal and with minimal worries or concerns. But that said, you took all the precautionary measures possible to make sure staff were protected. Although it was a slight concern that a member did not receive a message advising them to work from home, but it's understandable when we see the timing of the day at 4.30am, so we totally understand that. And I would say that you are to be congratulated for taking all the actions that you did and for your close working with the PSNI and other agencies. And I've no doubt that you're continuing to monitor the situation closely because we all know that um, staff are paramount in all of this. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, um, Harry, and it's lovely to see you, albeit in the virtual world as well. Um, I suppose just for um, clarity, uh, the phone call, the initial phone call that was made to the member of staff, um, and they didn't receive it because I would assume they were probably in bed at that stage. Yeah. I think they didn't receive that. However, following that phone call, um, the discussions took place with um, the local PSNI. So, in the event that we were informed that there was no information or intelligence available at that time to suggest that there was no risk of threat to the staff and um, member going to one point, we didn't um, proceed to try and contact them again in the middle of the night to try and stop them going because we, we were content with the um, assessment by the PSNI. Um, if, if that had been, um, I suppose, converse to that um, discussion, then uh, we would have made every effort to actually reach that member of staff before they left the house to attend work at 4.30 a.m. in the morning. Um, and, and as I said, just in the written submission, um, it was just uh, in the interests of I suppose providing um, comfort and um, security to the staff. Uh, we did implement um, 
additional um, measures just to provide that reassurance to staff members working with our colleagues in the PSNI. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you very much. And can I just finish by saying I was content with all the actions taken by yourself and the other councils. Good to see you. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Nat. Um, Philip? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thanks to both Chief Executives for coming along and, and giving evidence uh, to us today. As everybody has said, I understand this is a very busy time. So I, I'm just going to fire through a, a number of questions. The meeting on the 28th of the 1st of the SOLAS uh, subcommittee title, which I'm not going to EU task for whatever uh, foundation or force group, you, you, you were both present at that meeting, is that correct? No, Chair, no. no. My yeah. our, our members of staff would have been present at that. Um, okay. yeah. Fair enough. And is there, can I ask, is there minutes of these meetings? There are notes um, taken of the, the meetings, um, and uh, I, I now have received um, a minute um, of the meeting of the 28th of January, um, which I received last week. Um, so that has come in, and I'm sure that. Um, in response to your letter to um, the Solar's Chair um, in relation to these issues that those minutes would be available to the committee. Yeah, so you, you received the minutes of a meeting on the 28th of January last week after our committee? Well, I requested a copy of the, the minutes to be fair last week. Okay. Fair enough. Okay, and I, 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 know, I mean, obviously, okay, we'll see the minutes, so there's no need to go into that. Just in terms uh, specifically for the Belfast Council, because I mean, I've read the report in terms of the engagement with the PSNI, and, and I've listened to the questions today. I mean, I, I mean we, we received uh, evidence last week from uh, Mid East Atlan Council, and I mean, in terms of some of the, the evidence that we received, uh, you know, I, I'm looking here at the 1st of February where Miss Donaghy had a conversation with uh, yourself that morning and uh, Miss Donaghy shares her concerns with the Chief Executive of Belfast Council in relation to Lauren Port highlighting, yeah. highlighting there was uh, only one way out of port. She goes on then to talk about the PSNA where she says she passed these concerns on to the PSNA and had not received clarity from the PSNA in the situation. Miss Wiley highlighted that she found the whole situation very unusual. She felt that this was a very unique situation and that there was a lack of clarity from the PSNA. Both chief executives agreed that concern, concerning the situation was emerging fast. Further on in the day, then, uh, the chief executive of Mid and East Antrim uh, emailed Deira. Uh, this was about around the, setting up the meeting about on 4.45 later that day. So I don't, it goes on to say, whilst this was short notice, the Chief Executive stressed that the meeting was urgent. She highlighted that she had spoken with her colleague, the Chief Executive of Belfast City Council, who also had concerns and was happy to be part of the meeting. So, uh, I mean, had you concerns about the PSNI so, that are related to us by another Chief Executive? Yeah, my, my recollection um, of the discussion that morning um, was slightly different in terms of my response um, to uh, the issues that were being um, raised. So um, I had already spoken to um, the Director of City Services by the time I had spoken to the um, Mid East Antrim Chief Executive. So um, and, and she had assured me of the conversations that had happened with um, certainly with Deira the previous week, um, right up until the 28th, and also with the harbour. Um, police um, who had been in contact with the PSNI at that stage. Um, so, yeah, in my view, um, at that point was that for Belfast, um, the um, issues uh, were not as concerning. However, I wanted to listen to the concerns that were being raised um, by Minley Centrum and, and, of course, um, by others as well, because we had to be fully cognizant um, of all of, all of the, the facts. Um, uh, before we could make any sort of recommendation to our members and make any call in relation to, to the safety um, of our staff. Um, so I don't re recall saying um, that there was a lack of clarity from the police. I perhaps may have said I need to get more clarity from the police in terms of what the issues you have been raising. 
Okay, thank you. That, that's helpful. And in terms, uh, just the, the point that John made, because I, I've been through particularly the, the Belfast City Council evidence, and uh, you know, up until the 29th of the first, there had been regular contact uh, with the police and with trade unions, and you know, there, there was no particular issue of concern. John, as he has said, you know, I, I got the clear uh, indication from reading this that there was a flurry of activity then, uh, around the, the tw- from the 29th onwards to the. The, 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 I suppose the, the date when the, the minister resigned uh, as dear a minister and could no longer take actions on, on these things. Uh, and, and, and it has been pointed out that there seemed to be a lot of contact from them, the dear a minister and mid and East Antrim. So in terms of the contact and the fears and concerns that, that were being uh, spread out, you know, was there mention of paramilitary activity? Was there mention of uh, number plates of, uh, of staff being taken at any of the ports? And did you then verify, if that was the case, that these concerns were being raised, did you verify this with the PSNI? Either of you? Yeah, so I don't think Marie was involved in that particular conversation at that point in time, so I think that's for, for, for me to answer. Um, and if Marie has anything to add, of course. Um, so, um, in relation to what was raised, um, yet yeah, what was raised at, at those discussions was serious um, concerns at a grassroots level um, from a large perspective and more wider community pension concerns across um, the region were raised as well. Um, there were um, uh, alleged um, uh, connections to organised crime. Um, and uh, what um, you know that, that certainly in terms of conversations that I heard um, that that wasn't being suggested as fact. It was um, being alleged that that would um, have been the case. And yes, um, there was reference to um, a video be, being taken of cars um, at Larnport and slowing down cars at at Larnport and numbers um, being taken of cars. I do recall that. And so what. I, um, was I and um, clearly that is a, you know that is a concern of course as chief executive of the city council I want to make sure that that isn't um, the case when it comes to uh, the Belfast um, port so that is why immediately after those calls I, I directly contacted the commander um, for Belfast and he confirmed that the, that the threat level was, was low and not organized. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Sorry, and just chair from near and more down perspective, just for clarity, I wasn't involved in those discussions, so I wouldn't have anything further to add on that one. Okay, uh, so there was regular contact with the PS and I, and both chief executives, whenever that needed to be the case, were happy and satisfied that the information that the PS and I were given in relation to the nature of the threat was accurate, and you know you, you, there, there was no reason or rationale to distrust the PSNI assessment or to think that either uh, councils had better information than what was being provided by the PSNI? Well, I can only speak for myself um, because I'm responsible, of course, um, in relation to health and safety of staff um, within Belfast City Council. So, and of course, my questions were in relation to the PSNI, were in relation to the staff at Corey Place. Uh, which of course is set out is a very different location um, and much more controlled um, than uh, what would be the case at, at Lawn Port. But I was satisfied with the information that PSMI um, had provided me with, and um, they appeared very confident in their um, views. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Philip. Uh, William? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, in relation to um, uh, Chief Executive of Belfast Council uh, saying there that the police, there's no specific threat, that was in relation to your port in Belfast, and what, that wasn't in relation to Lauren, I presume. It was in relation to the port of Belfast, I think you would have been. You would have been getting the information in relation to your own port, is that right? My specific questions to the PSNI um, were about um, the safety of my staff and the threat to, to my staff um, at Belfast in the context within which 
um, they were working. Um, however, it's the overall threat assessment, um, which was provided on the 4th of February, as you know, the written assessment talks about a low level um, of threat. Yeah, okay. Well, it was in relation to Belfast Sport and Adelaide Port. You have the information you have to say, right? Specifically, yes. And it was a verbal report, not a written report, would that be right? Yes. Until the 4th of February, it was a verbal report um, from senior officers in PSNI, um, and also through meetings that were held, as we mentioned, the, the Operation Skies Partners Meeting, as it's called, um, uh, with PSNI, um, that uh, we weren't involved in initially as, as councils, uh, that we were then invited to from the 2nd of February on, and they were held on a daily basis during that particular week. Uh, so, so would it be the case, and I've been in both ports getting on ferries in the past, but uh, we have been told that Belfast Port is probably more safer, it's, it, it's not as vulnerable as Lauren Port. Uh, I think we have been told in the past there's only one way in and one way out of Lauren Port, so it's, it's maybe slightly more vulnerable than Belfast would be, would that be the case, do you know? I don't know Lauren Port, Port but certainly from talking to um, the Chief Executive of Midnight Centrum at the time, um, she did articul articulate the concerns about one way in and one way out. Um, on the meetings I was involved um, in, and uh, and uh, obviously I've, I've set out, and hopefully you can see the, the map of where our staff are located within that passport. And it is within a controlled area with barrier access only and CCTV on those access points. And then, of course, there are dedicated fire police that are there 24 7. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Um, no other members down here. So, um, uh, Suzanne, Javon, and Marie, uh, I want to thank you very much for attending uh, this morning and taking all of the answers, uh, questions, and answering all of the uh, providing very fulsome answers. So, thank you very much for for attending. Okay. Um, can I seek agreement to publish the council briefing papers on the committee's web page? Okay. Yes. Okay, members. Um, item seven now on the agenda is a written briefing from the Research and Information Services on Nature Friendly Farming. Uh, it's at page 90, so it is the uh, briefing paper. Uh, you may find it useful and, and informative for the committee's work on the subject. Um, item number eight is we're going to receive an oral evidence session now from the Nature Friendly Farming Network. Uh, the written briefing is page 120. I want to welcome uh, by Starleaf, and Mr. Michael Meharg is the NA Chair, Mr. Tim Morrow, the NA Steering Group Member, Mr. David Sanford, NA Steering Group Member, and Mr. Simon Best, the NA Ste uh, Steering Group Member. I want to invite the representatives to take 10 minutes to brief the committee, and then members will ask some questions thereafter. So, you are very welcome this morning. Just getting, uh, just getting myself organised here. Uh, hopefully, everybody can hear me okay. Yeah, we got. Well, I can hear you anyway. Is everybody, all our members okay? That, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, good morning, chair and, and committee. Um, first of all, let me say thank you on behalf of the Nature Friendly Farming Network uh, for giving us the opportunity to give evidence on this important motion. Um, the Nature Friendly Farming Network is a, a UK-wide group established in 2017. We're made up of farmers who see our business and economic prosperity inextricably linked to the nature and the natural environment. And we farm with and for nature and the environment. While we're based in the north, we have members from across Ireland, all delivering for nature within their farm businesses. Um, my name is Michael Maharg and I'm currently the Northern Ireland Chair and we have a very active local committee, some of whom are joining us this morning. Along with my family, we farm over 600 acres with suckler cows and beef cattle, most of which um, we're farming on, on old ANC land, which I know, uh, Chair, you have a very strong interest in, and within the Loch Ney catchment and the Belfast Hills. Um, you've already been debating important environmental matters this morning, and there's no doubt we are currently facing significant societal challenges, which must be urgently addressed 
from devastating declines in nature, the climate emergency, and risks to the long-term productivity and profitability of our sector. 75% of Northern Ireland's land is managed as farmland. And so as farmers, we are key to meeting the challenges ahead, helping to secure long-term food security and to meet ambitious biodiversity and climate targets. As we begin to head into a new farming system and start to determine how farmers work with nature, address climate change and produce food, there are major opportunities to reshape how we support farmers and to deliver these important objectives. In NFFN, we believe that transitioning to nature-friendly farming practices will be crucial in this regard. But what is nature-friendly farming and how can we deliver it at scale? Nature-friendly farming is an umbrella term to describe farming systems and practices that enhance and protect biodiversity and contribute to tackling climate change along with food production. Nature-friendly farming is not only better for nature, but also ensures that our land remains productive, ensuring that we can go on producing good food into the future. Delivering nature-friendly farming at scale will require different interventions for different farming systems across Northern Ireland. For example, many lowland arable, mixed and livestock systems, this will mean dedicating around 10% of the farm to habitats that benefit nature. And of course, many farms are already achieving this total without really realizing the contribution that they're making. In other areas, such as in the uplands or in areas of high nature value, the landscapes here will focus on ensuring that the systems continue to provide their vital function in supporting farmland biodiversity, quality landscapes and water management. As well as delivering for nature, a nature-friendly farming system must ensure that the underpinning system is also sustainable. This will include measures to ensure that the natural resources such as air, water and soil are managed sustainably, that actions to integrate climate mitigation measures are undertaken and that the business, the business strives to reduce or eliminate negative impacts to the wider environment. Often nature is seen as, as an, a burden or an additional burden to be managed rather than an integral part of the farm business. It's important that nature underpins profitability. A healthy farmland ecosystem means a healthy bottom line. Nature is good for business and essential for our future. Farm businesses can benefit economically by adopting more nature-friendly production practices. For example, better business planning can reduce costs, boost nature and increase economic resilience. Nature-friendly farming systems can also benefit from diverse income streams as a result of more diverse farmland landscapes, as well as producing premium in-demand products. As consumers are rapidly becoming more aware of the climate and environmental impacts of foods they buy, demand for local, nature-friendly products will only increase. And we've seen the benefit of this during lockdown, how, how folk are turning towards much more of a local sourced food supply. And many farmers are already playing an incredible role in helping wildlife flourish on their farms. We believe that policy should better support them for this work. Whilst helping others to transition to nature-friendly farming as part of the standard practice. On our farm, we are in the EFS wider and higher schemes. We have fenced off rivers to improve water quality, reduce grazing pressure on sensitive grasslands and bog sites to help plants and insects, planted trees as a habitat and to catch carbon for years and generations to come, and have installed a small renewable energy generation facility, selling energy to the grid. We have hares and otters, orchids and ferns, woodlands, woodlands and hedgerows, and even space for a fairy thorn tree in the farm. But this is alongside a positive business and a business where our bottom line is very important to us. NFFN Northern Ireland is calling for future policies to help all Northern Ireland farmers to produce safe, healthy food at the same time as helping our soils, our landscapes, our rivers and wildlife to flourish whilst delivering ambitious action on climate change. But we recognise that, that urgent action is needed to drive rapid change to the current farming systems through a culture of innovation and a flexible and responsive system to support transition that we maintain the current levels of agricultural support and redirect farming payments towards mainstreaming nature-friendly farming whilst ensuring that this adds measurable value to the environment and to our businesses. 
recognise that the shift towards a more nature-friendly approach is not just good for wildlife, but is key to the long-term survival of the Northern Irish farming community, delivering broader benefits to the public, including flood protection, water and air quality, carbon storage, and the maintenance of thriving natural landscapes and wildlife. And to make sure future schemes are practical and accessible to all farmers. And also to continually monitor and assess the environmental performance to ensure that nature-friendly farming and the support is delivering measurable impacts for nature and the environment and the public. And finally, to ensure that the quality of produce from our industry reflects the quality of the land we farm, with market recognition of the value through suitable reward for nature-friendly products. I think at this point, I'd like to hand over to Simon, who will tell us a little about his enterprise. Thank you, Michael. Um... Thanks, Chair. Uh, ensuring that we as farmers take a long-term view of sustainability and enhancement of our environment is extremely important. Uh, the vast majority of farmers understand this, but agriculture and food supply policies have put the sector under huge pressure to deliver low-cost food. Um, our environment is one of our greatest assets, and politically this hasn't received enough support. When we look at the level of investment in supporting nature-friendly land management, Northern Ireland is investing a fraction of what is needed. This has led to underinvestment and adequate focus, and in many cases, a lack of understanding on the ground of nature and the environment. Recognising the value of nature friendly farming is crucial to this long term view. On our farm, we've been striving to ensure that sustainability is accounted for within all of our operations through a reduction of inputs with a key focus on soil health, ambitions to reduce climate impact of our operations, and through the creation of sensitive and creation sensitive management of a range of habitats on farm. From these interventions, I've seen considerable increases in soil health with improvements in soil organic matter and fertility, which not only make our farm more resilient and productive, but also help to reduce our costs. Incorporating biodiversity friendly habitats on around 10% of our farmed land has helped to benefit priority species such as lapwing, reed bunting, and linnet, also pollinators and mammals, but has allowed us also to market our, market our approach to consumers who are increasingly demanding that farmers do more for nature and biodiversity. Monitoring and accounting and analysing is extremely important to me. Uh, we need to be able to continuously assess performance to demonstrate the value of what we are doing for the environment to the wider public. All farmers will measure and analyse crop yields, but not their output for nature. This must be a mindset change as part of a new system with return for environment and biodiversity outputs in line with outputs from other farm enterprises. On our farm, we undertake regular soil analysis, water quality monitoring, and bird and habitat surveys. These are undertaken by, by a mix of professionals and dedicated volunteers, helping us to, to collect the necessary data for us to make informed business decisions and demonstrate return on investment. More recently, we focused on what we can do from a carbon perspective, and are one of the seven participating farms uh, in the recent Arc Zero project. Uh, the outcome of this project will be to establish a verifiable, robust baseline for carbon action, focused on delivering reductions in greenhouse gas emissions across the business. Delivering these object objectives across Northern Ireland will require significant long-term investment, as well as a long-term direction of travel and defined outcomes and priorities for farming and land management. A commitment to support nature-friendly farming will be vital to ensuring that farming is capable of delivering these ambitions, whilst helping to enhance the resilience and sustainability of the sector for the longer term ahead. Um, I now hand over to Tim Morrow, who will speak on his experience uh, of environmental biodiversity and of the supply chain. Thanks, Simon, and thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm Tim Morrow, farming in the Castlereagh right Hills, looking down on Stormont as we speak. Um, <laughs> Simon mentioned, um, uh, current agriculture and food policy has really led us down a completely unsustainable path where value has only been placed on cheap food rather on quality of the food where or where it has come from. This has led to degraded soils, diminishing wildlife, and it also has made it difficult for farmers to actually make any profit from their operations as they are having to put in more and more inputs to get the same output. So we need to shift back to a more sustainable farming system. 
which helps build resist, re resilience holistically. And the word that people use nowadays is regenerative methods, which helps to build back the organic matter in our soils. And actually the biggest carbon soak on the planet, apart from the sea, is actually the soil. Our own business works to shorten supply chains and eliminate waste, farm sustainably and work with the local community to demonstrate the immense value of local nature friendly farming. We have just started the delivery business in the last few months over lockdown with where we just went to local high quality producers of all sorts of foods, got them together and started delivering to the local community. And people, that's exactly what people are looking for, high quality food that they know where it has come from and they know the quality that has been there. So we have found localising supply chains are far more robust and resilient than the longer integrated supply chains, which often don't provide a fair return to farmers anyway. So our business is intrinsically linked to the local economy and to the community. We're committed to reinvesting back into the localised chain supply and improving nature so others can enjoy it as we do. But government needs to commit to putting nature at the centre of policy and there needs to be clear guidance and timescales for farmers or there's no chance of making this happen. Transitioning towards a progressive, profitable and sustainable farming sector will require long-term investment but the rewards will be worth it. Farming in a nature-friendly way increases our resilience to varying farm costs and also extreme weather events and more. And we're also diversifying in doing this, which is all good because it means not all of our eggs are in one basket. So we need a future policy that can work to help deliver a nature-friendly food system through capital funding to increase competitiveness, create and develop shorter supply chains and trial innovative technologies. There are also opportunities being presented through Northern Ireland's increasing recognition as a tourist destination. And again, we're hoping to open a glamping site tomorrow, would you believe, on the hills of Castle Ray here. But as usual, there was no incentives or help from any grant system that was available to help us do this. Finally, uh, gentlemen, ladies, I would like to say environmental objectives and adequate funding must be incorporated into all aspects of food and ag policy so that farming businesses view the environment and sustainability as a core aspect of their business rather than something that is just nice to do if I can afford it. I'm now going to pass you on to David. Thank you, Tim. Um, our thoughts on a new delivery framework for farm support. Future schemes which incentivize and reward nature-friendly farming practices will be vital, vital in delivering a transition towards nature-friendly farming. We believe that a future payment scheme focused on delivering positive environmental land management should represent the principal means of farm support. In the future, payments for environmental delivery would help provide a stable and reliable income source for farm businesses, whilst delivering multiple goods, services and benefits for society. This will represent fair value for money to the taxpayer and provide a robust justification for long-term public investment in farming and land management. The policy should be holistic, based on the whole farm operation, including both productive and non-productive areas. Critical to a scheme's future success is the funding allocated towards it. Under the cap, the RDP budget has been insufficient to in meeting environmental needs. Northern Ireland currently has the lowest percentage of farm support for environmental interventions in the United Kingdom. The current EFS scheme is basically a well-designed scheme, but the take-up has been low for various reasons, but mainly due to the financial capping and the constraints on the wider scheme. A new or similar support scheme could be relaunched as the basic platform for all financial support for farmers going forward. DERA currently has an excellent farm mapping tool that could be used to identify and record all farm areas and all the natural assets, bogs and wet areas, 
woodland, scrub and hedges, as well, of course, productive fields. This tool could be used to measure and then reward, but only if these areas were managed in a nature-friendly farming way, such as hill or marginal ground, if using regenerative practices, sustainable stocking rates for livestock, growing more cereals, especially spring cereals, soil testing, providing more carbon capture assets such as proper hedgerows and woodland, multi-species grass and swords, and for ammonia mitigation practices, and agroforestry, and measuring on a farm's progress towards net zero, etc., etc. The possibilities will be endless within a new support system framework and only limited by the will of government and funding. But if politicians are serious about farmers being part of the solution to climate change and biodiversity loss, then we must be given the tools. On my arable farm near Strangford, under the APS scheme, I have instated six metre rough grass margins around my fields, stopping nutrient runoff in the loch and aiding biodiversity. I have planted new hedges and I personally provide winter feed crops for wild birds, all with good results. Under previous planting schemes, I have planted broadleaf trees on less productive ground. I have also reduced my crop inputs. My farmland bird count has grown dramatically, and last year we had two breeding pairs of barn owls out of probably only 20 pairs left in the whole of Northern Ireland. Before there were none on my farm in the previous 30 years. They are only there because they like the biodiversity that my farm now provides. Also in a recent carbon audit on a Northern Ireland farm, it was estimated that nature-friendly farming habitats were increased by even 5%. It would result in the sequestering of an additional 168 tonnes of CO2 per year from that one farm. I and many other farmers could do far more in the move to net zero if we, were properly, if we had properly funded schemes. Recent research demonstrates that to meet the government's environmental objectives, it would require an eight-fold increase in funding for environmental farm management. But we believe this could be achieved broadly within the current total spend on agricultural support in Northern Ireland. Many farm businesses are reliant on farm support in its current form, and a transition towards a new system should be planned and managed carefully and include training and knowledge transfer. Moving towards a payment system linked to environmental delivery represents a significant shift from the status quo, meaning businesses must be fully prepared. Government would set out the direction of travel clearly from the outset, outlining how they intend to phase out current scheme arrangements whilst moving towards a new scheme. Farmers are expecting change. And in a recent farm survey carried out by NIEL, 63% of farmers were concerned at lack of policy direction from government. 45% were either dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with the current agro-environmental schemes. And 65% wanted increased funding with such schemes. Mr Chairman, we strongly believe with a new scheme, given the right investment and long-term support, farm businesses will be safeguarded produce healthy, affordable food, restore the environment, and play their part in addressing climate change. Thank you. I'll be hand back to Michael. Well, thank you very much, guys. And um, for, thank you, Chair, for allowing us to speak. I'll just sum up here that, and we hope that the presentations have shown our vision for the future and some examples of nature-friendly practice. And we hope this can be scaled up and the farming sector uh, can adapt to that. But we can't do this alone. We will need help to transition from the CAP support we currently receive. As we've heard, nature is good for business. It's good for my business and it's vital to our future. There is increasing recognition that the environmental production practices are essentially for robust supply chains. In short, to ensure we have good food on the table. We feel that we have a once in a lifetime generation opportunity to, to help farmers to underpin their long-term business sustainability and resilience to market and climate challenges and financial viability, which means working in harmony with nature. Farming policy needs to support the industry to rapidly move to a sustainable output model that enhances natural capital and nature and can address the nature and climate emergencies. We urge the committee to endorse the proposed motion 
and consider how our recommendations can roll out nature-friendly farming at scale across Northern Ireland. Um, thank you, and we're happy to take any questions from the, from the group. Um, thank you very much. That was a very interesting um, presentation, and coming at a very interesting time, too, uh, where we're looking at the whole climate change. Um, Michael, um, I was intrigued listening to all of you. So obviously, the fact that you've got um, 600 uh, sucklers and you're, you know, you're managing your farm in a very nature-friendly manner. Um, I suppose, just, just leading back to our previous um, uh, presentation on climate change, um, would you have any assessment of whether uh, or not that you are um, uh, net zero in terms of your emissions? So, um, just, just uh, Chairman, just to, to say, of 600 acres, not 600 sucklers. Oh, gosh, I 600 wish. suckers. <laughs> <laughs> right, but, uh, uh, but, but to go, but to go on on that, um, I, I think, I think the the, the, the issue is um, that we're all um, at a situation where we we realise that um, the climate emergency, and biodiversity emergencies are are, are there. Um, and we realise that as farmers, we are one of the areas that uh, it has been assessed as having a, a high output of carbon and a high usage of carbon. But at the same time, I think we have great opportunities to, uh, to, to work to lower our carbon footprint. So I managed to have a, a student, um, a lad called Adam Copeland, who, who was doing an MSc at Queen's last year, looking at sustainability. And he came to my farm and did um, an overview of the carbon footprint on the farm. And what we got them to do was to look at the various algorithms and assessments that are there to be used to work out net zero and, and work out what my carbon footprint was, looking at all the inputs, looking at all the outputs. And um, the interesting thing there was that there seemed to be quite a range of results coming from different methods of, of use. And, and while we're on our way towards net zero, like every farmer, there are opportunities to improve. Um, we've just planted a, a 1.4 hectare woodland on the farm under the farm uh, small woodland grant scheme. There, there are also uh, part of that journey we've still got to go. So we're away towards net zero. Um, that's what I'm trying to achieve on the farm. But at the same time, realizing that there are challenges ahead with that and there are other um, steps we'll have to take. So we're, we're doing a lot on our own farm, but I think like every other farmer, there are opportunities and challenges there. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll pass to Simon, who, who has, uh, with his Arc Zero engagement, maybe would have uh, a, a bit more to add to that. Thanks, Michael. Yes, uh, very happy to do so. I suppose one of the issues that I've had in, in this discussion over the past few years has been actually what our baseline is and how we establish it. So. Uh, recently, um, within the last few months, I have um, I'm now part of the Arc Zero project, um, which is an EIP project led by uh, Dr. John Gearland as our chair. So there's seven farms, mostly concentrating on um, assessing ruminant carbon. But I'm I'm a cereal farmer um, who also has some some ruminant livestock, but but really interested to see what uh, our verifiable baseline is. So. It's a two-year project. We're looking at um, everything from soil carbon, soil organic matter. Uh, we're using lidar analysis to, to assess our whole farm um, runoff and, and carbon habitat. So, I suppose to, to answer the question, um, I'm not sure yet, but I am very confident that in the next um, 12 to 18 months, I will I will have a very good idea of what it is, and that will be verifiable and a baseline for me then to work on and to improve going forward. Um, using some of the some of the systems that I already have in place, and obviously new systems and technology that might come into to discussion through that. Yeah, because uh, I do think that um, that that's one of the things I think that all farmers need here in the north, particularly if we're, we are trying to transition towards uh, a net zero. Um, farmers need to be able to establish uh, what their baseline is to begin with, and I know there, for for example, six years ago, the department about the the bovis calculator uh, to, to, for farmers to try and work that out. But I do get a sense that there needs to be a very robust and clear method for farmers to work out exactly where they're at. If they're expected to, to transition towards net zero, there needs to be a, an accurate measuring tool to work all that out. 
and um, um, and I, I do think that that's I think that's something that's absolutely uh, absolutely crucial. Um, and the post before we move around the room, because uh, there's quite a bit of interest here. Um, the, at the present time in the north here, um, we, we provide food for around uh, 10 million people. Uh, it employs 100,000 uh, people here in the agri-food um, sector here, which is a huge, huge big chunk of our um, local economy here. Um, and do you think that, um, um, that, that if we can tra tra transition towards nature-friendly farming, uh, that we can continue to sustain those jobs um, uh, as, as we move ahead? Um, I think it's, uh, I mean, the, the, the question is, is an important one. And, and, you know, I think there are going to be challenges ahead for the, the whole of the um, economy. We've, we've seen over the last time as farmers that, that our, our customers are the general public the, the, the locally. That's our biggest customer. And there are changes taking place in both the quality of food that, that our customers are expecting, but also in the type of food that, that they're expecting. And farmers as business people, we can't just expect that whatever we produce will be taken up. We've got to supply what the market demands. And I think that as um, the society changes towards net zero, there will be changes and challenges to the products that, that we supply and will have to supply. But there's still going to have to be the same volume of food there to be consumed by our, by our, our population. So I think that's one, one challenge that we'll, we'll have to look at into the future. We have obviously a, a, a marketing side where we're an export side where we, despite the, the Brexit challenges, we are supplying food to, to folk outside of, of Ireland and Northern Ireland. And, and that's something that will still be a demand for. But the way in which we, we work to produce that food, I think is something that we will have to examine closely and see, can we grow more protein crops at home to provide the protein rather than importing from um, other parts of the world that are under pressure and, and the, the high carbon footprint that comes with that. Those are the sorts of challenges that I think we'll, we'll have to address. And um, I think maybe uh, I'll pass to uh, any other members of, of our group who might feel that, that they would like to add to that. Maybe Tim, if there's anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm a dairy farmer, so we have 240 dairy cows up here. And uh, we used to farm, I suppose, the way most people did, just calving most of the year round. And... Uh, feeding a, a fairly high amount of, of meal to, to the cows and the vast majority of that meal comes from America or Canada or Russia or somewhere. It certainly isn't grown here. And I didn't like it, basically didn't like the system. So we changed over to uh, a, a New Zealand style uh, farming system where we calve the cows when the grass starts to grow and we feed the cows grass, grass and more grass and very little of anything else. So the average amount of meal being fed per cow in Northern Ireland is well over two tonnes of cow now and we're feeding under half a tonne of cow. And that in, in itself helps my carbon footprint. I still have a profitable business uh, that works and I'm not saying everyone should be doing what I'm doing but I'm just sort of giving an example of different ways of being able to farm that has less of a carbon footprint. I'll give you another very quick example of one policy change that would make a massive difference. And David mentioned it earlier on. And that is if there was some sort of encouragement for dairy and beef farmers to, to put in mixed species swords, or they're also called herbal lays, which are a mixture of, of perennial ryegrass and, and herbs and clover. And putting that in, that one action of putting that in halves or less than halves the amount of fertiliser you need to put onto the ground because it fixes nitrogen itself and grows just as much with half the amount of nitrogen. And not only that, when the cows eat these mixed swords, they produce less methane. So 20% less methane. And yet, even with these, these huge benefits to the environment, there's absolutely no incentive for any farmer to do this. And most dairy farmers reseed 10% of their ground per year. 
So if you were actually to encourage people to do this, a lot of dairy farmers within 15 years could have reseeded their entire farm into this mixed species, would have had their fertilizer use and would have cut down their methane by 20%. And that's just one policy change. There are so many examples of things I think that could be done. Uh, funny, I was actually going to mention about the, the importance of soil sampling, and I've noted here clover, use of lime. Uh, and both the one thing maybe I would mention to you as well, and I'm sorry for hogging this, but I find very interesting, is um, the issue of fertiliser. You know, what, would, what sort of fertiliser would you use? Would, do you use like the, the urea protected fertiliser, or what, what methods would you typically use? Well, so, here's. Sorry, okay. Um, in our case, we have gone over to protected urea in the last year. Um, I suppose before that, we really didn't realise that uh, it, it had any issue before that. So uh, we have been, since the research has been done, we've gone on the protected urea for the first outing round the farm. And we get the farm, the entire farm soil sampled every year so as we know where we are and, and what we need. And you're absolutely right, Chairman, mentioning lime. Uh, lime is so crucial on ground that you can put on loads of fertilizer. There's no use such if you don't have the right pH in the soil. Yeah, so basically, it's it's more it's more efficient. It costs very little to sample the soil, but it could, it could actually save you in the long run. So you're put you're, you're you're not putting on the wrong fertilizer effect, and you're not overloading the nitrogen, which yeah. is costly and, and not very not very much so, friendly. So, Chairman, I'll, I'll uh, add to that just from a different perspective because um, I'm I'm farming in in. Um, there is a natural constraint uh, a lot of my land in the uplands and the way the way that i look at, at my inputs there is that um, my main inputs are sunshine and rain that's that's what i farm and um, that's my inputs and so the carrying capacity of the land is, is what i look at i don't put any other fertilizer on, on those upland sites some of them are protected um, under the legislation so you know there is a special scientific interest so obviously that that wouldn't come into it but at the same time, those natural swords have a carrying capacity. And so I put the density of and the, um, the, the number of cattle onto the, the land that that land can, can carry and, and can give me a production. Too many cattle and it spoils the land for that year or the next year. And too few, I, I'm, I'm wasting the resource that's there. So I try to look at it from the point of view of natural carrying capacity. Thank you very much, Michael. I'm going to move around the room. Um, William. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, got you. Okay, okay. Can I thank the gentleman for uh, giving the presentation? Um, I have the pleasure of being on Simon Best's farm and seeing firsthand the nature friendly farming uh, and how it uh, enhances wildlife. And uh, I, I very much welcome those that are involved. And I think. There is a perception out there that large farms don't play their part in relation to the environment, but I think you gentlemen today has proved that large farms can actually play their part very well. Um, you, I think in general, all feel that more funding is needed and more incentives are needed to encourage farmers to sow the proper grasses uh, and do the right things to help the environment. Um, what about tree planting and marginal land? Is that a, what's your feeling on that too? Um, I, I'll maybe start off with that. Um, the the um, tree planting is very important. Clearly, it's very important. Um, the minister has uh, had announced last year a target of planting uh, an extra. Um, 9,000 hectares of land for, for carbon sequestration in, in woodland over the next number of years, the next 10 years. And we at home have taken advantage of, of the grant already, the Small Woodland Grant Scheme, we've just planted a woodland. And we've, we've chosen an area on the farm that um, was, wasn't was the best of, of productivity. It was um, a slightly uh, wetter area. It was an area that, that uh, was slightly more difficult. Um, there's, there's good support there for that. I think the most important thing, and, and one, of, one of our members, Tony Johnson, is, is, is um, part of the farm woodland uh, uh, business that he has, has told us and, and, and would go with the mantra, and I, I'm sure he'd be pleased that I'm mentioning this, is that the right tree in the right place is, is a way to go forward. 
Um, th there is land in, in marginal areas which would be suitable for tree planting, but there would also be land that wouldn't be because of its nature value. And so it's important to make sure that, and, and as I say, repeating his words, the right tree in the right place would be the way forward. Um, I think David has experience of planting trees on, on, on his farm, and maybe you'd like to mention something with that, David? Um, yes, I certainly would. Uh, and I think that's, that's right. Tony's quote is completely correct. Uh, it's much easier on farms like Simon and perhaps my farm as well, which are lowland farms, in so much that it's fairly obvious that we plant up the areas that aren't productive first. Um, certainly, if, if, um, if, if stocking rates really came under, uh, um, un under the microscope regarding net, obtaining net, net zero, then of course productive land might have to be and probably will have to be planted up and perhaps should be planted up. But, but at the moment, I've gone as far as really planting up less productive ground with broad leaves. But we desperately need a bit more information on which varieties of trees, what sort of tree cover uh, actually sequesters carbon better than anything else. So there's quite a lot of work that hedgerows actually per square metre sequester more carbon than woodlands do. That's probably because of the dense mass. But, you know, unmanaged um, hedgerows are much better than managed hedgerows. So the variety is very important. It makes farming operations a lot easier. You can straighten up a field edge and all these things come into play. But they also will give a farmer and the farmer's family and those coming after immeasurable pleasure. There's nothing nicer than seeing a nice stand of trees on a bit of ground that you've planted yourself. I started planting here, oh, nearly 30 years ago now, and everyone says, oh, it takes ages for trees to grow. If broad leaves put in conifers, they'll pop up quickly and you can sell them. But I can tell you, broad leaves put in, the, put in well, the right varieties grow really, really quickly and are a tremendous asset to wildlife and also for sequestering carbon. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, William, Philip? Thanks, Chair. Uh, I, I mean, I think that that was very, very interesting. A couple of questions I had wanted to ask are, are actually gone. But in terms of farmers and farms uh, owners here, I mean, the average age uh, of Irish farmers is 57. So, I mean, in terms of your primary goal, uh, is it to try and convert existing farmers uh, to nature-friendly farming or is it more about setting the groundwork for the next generations of farmers to adopt these methods? Um, the, the, the future of farming and the future of, of the management of our land is very important and there, there, there are good schemes that, that the department has for encouraging young farmers to come into the industry now. Um, I think maybe, maybe <laughs> looking at myself and others, uh, sometimes um, we, we, we maybe just keep on going and keep on farming maybe a, a bit too long and hence the, the average age is, is, is up there. Um, but I think it's important that, that we're, we're, I suppose, I don't think we're trying to be evangelical and, and to convert people to, to anything. I think what we're really saying is that there is a way there that farming as a baseline could be and should be, and that policy and support should be used to favour that, that way forward. Our agricultural colleges uh, are, are training people through Greenmount and other places, are training the, the, the next generation in all of the environmental aspects that, that are good for their land and good for their business. And as David said in his uh, presentation, um, so knowledge transfer is very important. The, um, the business development groups and the environmental business development groups have a lot of support and, um, and environmental farming scheme has been um, oversupplied, especially in, in, in the higher in environmental farming scheme. So, you know, th there are signs there that, that uh, there are, there's a an awful lot of interest. There's an awful lot of training going, going into the next generation coming through. And what we would hope is, is that maybe by, by showing what can be done, there are examples there. We're very happy and, and have welcomed many people onto our farms and, and other uh, people within our nature-friendly farming network 
to show just a little bits that we're doing. We're, I don't think we're doing anything extra special. We're just doing what we're doing and, and farming in a particular way. And that is something that shows that, that as businessmen and business people, we, we are economically viable through it and that we're also having a, 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 a small an impact on the environment that, <clears throat> excuse me, as we can. Um, Simon, would you like to add to that? You're very happy to, Michael. Yeah, I mean, I think um, for me, clearly, there's a need to move towards more sustainable measures in order to meet our climate change obligations. People will want to move at a very different pace, and that's, that's fine. Um, I think what we're advocating here is that support is is um, put towards the farmers who want to move to, to more nature friendly way of farming. Um, there are certainly ways in which that can then support the Northern Ireland food production industry, as far as I'm concerned. I have locations um, um, which are once five miles away in White's Oats, where I supply oats um, into, the, into the, the supply chain right beside me. Also, three miles away, I have a a local pig farmer. He's a he's a an intensive pig producer, but I supply him with with wheat and barley, and hopefully in the future protein crops that I would see coming from a, a more nature friendly farmer with the biodiversity and the carbon um, f- footprint reduction measures that I want to put in place will obviously then reduce his footprint. He can continue to produce, um, but I think it, it's farmers like um, us who need the incentive to help support. Uh, the climate change ambitions of Northern Ireland in general to allow us to continue to have a um, certain production base. Okay. Uh, and so, so just, just on that last object, I because mean, obviously you, you're coming in to speak to us uh, after we've heard this morning uh, from Claire and, and the team around the climate bill, uh, and there was quite a lot of discussion during that about uh, agriculture, and obviously it's been touched on here. I mean, do you believe as an organisation that we can reach net zero here by 2045 uh, and still maintain and support uh, the agri-food industry? Um, Simon, do you, do you want to carry on with, with uh, the, the answer to that one? Yeah, well, I mean, as I said, I mean, I still very much consider myself a food producer and passionate about it, but I'm also looking at ways in which um, I can significantly reduce my carbon footprint and support Northern Ireland uh, agri-food industry in, as part of that. I think in terms of, um, I think what's very clear is we need urgent action rather than continuous debate on what that target date is, whether that's 2045 or 2050. And if we don't start the journey now, you know, I think we'd have little chance of getting to either. Um, you know, putting that very simply, I'm a, I'm a crop farmer. I put my crops in the ground in September and October in order to harvest them the following August. If I haven't put them in, I won't, I won't have the crop there. So it, it, what I'm, I suppose, putting it very simply is we need a plan in place now that will help us get to those targets. Um, you know, I'm also a father of young children who are across the narrative of climate change. Um, and I guess I'm compelled to act as soon and as decisively as possible on that front. Um, but I guess as a business, you know, I believe we need to be ambitious in our targets to ensure we get some progress and action um, as soon as possible. Um, and I think when it comes to policy, um, you know, we need policy to drive those changes. I think there'll be advances in technology that we haven't even seen yet, but it needs policy to, to, to create the need for that innovation. So I suppose that, that around, around the date, I think it's about action and plans now that will allow us to move and, and support the entire industry. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, Claire? Thank you, Chair, and thank you for being with us today. Um, it's great to hear your views, and it's great to see you again, Michael. Um, just for everybody's uh, knowledge, I've, I've spent an afternoon up on Michael's farm last year. Um, thank you for that. Maybe we'll look, we still hear a lot of concern, um, particularly from the sector, but in, in general, that moving to nature-friendly farming um, is costly, is expensive, and I think you've already identified uh, when you were talking to us that you know it's seen as a bit of a luxury. You know, if you can afford it, all well and good, and away you go. Uh, do you feel that that 
moving toward nature-friendly farming is an economic disincentive for most. Um, and the other thing I want to look at is, do you feel that there is the potential for increased em employment across the sector um, if we move to a green economy in particular? Well, thanks, Claire. Um, I'll, I'll maybe pass that to, to David to, to, to answer, um, and, uh, to, or leave the start, and the rest of us can, can join in with that. Um, uh, yeah, Michael, thank you, Claire, for the question. Um, yes, I, I, think, I think the issue we have at the moment is there are, as I said, good and bad within the current EFS scheme. Uh, it, it does need to be looked at because I know a lot of farmers who were in the old NICMS scheme uh, are not in the EFS because um, the capping made it hardly worth their while to actually do it. I'm a bit of a zealot in these things, so I will do whatever I can do and afford to do. But I completely understand I'm not a typical farmer in that respect. And farmers have got a certain amount of land that they've got to maximize their income from. So they need help. We, you know, they desperately need help to get down the road to achieve and start on the road to net zero. Um, on the question about employment, I think it's a very good one, and I think we haven't even touched on the employment opportunities that will come out of having to achieve net zero and the green recovery. Um, I know there's a big meat uh, manufacturer, meat plant very close to me here, working really hard on, on, um, on uh, producing uh, um, plant-based foods at this current moment, and they're doing a huge amount of research on it. So if we can grow the prime protein crops that, that Simon is at the moment and I perhaps could in the future and process it and sell it locally, I'm not saying protein crops are the sort of mantra and I don't want to get the whole the vegan conversation, but there are lots of other things uh, happening in this world at the moment. Uh, but green energy is a huge opportunity for people in Northern Ireland because we, we are, you know, and people in Britain as well, because we are behind the curve compared to many European nations like Holland on that. Although we've, we've made great inroads, there's still a huge opportunity. And we might easily find that say, I don't want to be scaremongering, but say the livestock numbers in Northern Ireland did reduce that the employment opportunities on the green energy path would outweigh that issue. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, John. Thank you, Chair. And can I thank all of those who, who have um, given us their presentation today and, and the information they're in. Um, and I'm particularly pleased to hear of um, all of the, how the actions relate to the <clears throat> climate emergency conversation we had earlier in our, in our meeting, and that, that's very useful. So I'm not going to ask any further questions around that, although I have intended to. Can I ask separately then, um, is it the case that one of the things we need to, to secure the future of nature-friendly farming and to increase capacity of that is a Northern Ireland bespoke agriculture bill? And that that would be part and parcel of moving forward all of these issues. And I'm keen to hear views on that. Slightly separate issue, but but I think relevant. Um, th thank you very much, John. Yes, uh, I I think it is. It's it, it's very important to to have our our own local um, um, targets and opportunities, you know, enshrined in law. And I think for for any of the the things that that we're trying to to achieve. Whether it's the nature-friendly farming side, they, they mentioned the climate side, and, and, and linking towards a climate um, target, um, but but to support the the ways in which that can be funded and and looked at from a local perspective, we, we are different here. Uh, there's no question of that. We're 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 slightly remote from the rest of the the UK in terms of of what Brexit has brought us and in terms of what um, the just our, our, our geography is. And we have a link to to um, um, another European or to a European member right right on our, our doorstep, and the opportunities and challenges that that, that will bring in, into the future. So, having our own agricultural bill, I think, is crucial to maximising the opportunities that are there for us as a business, and with that, to ensure that that's all done, taking account of the climate emergency and the. Um, the opportunities for, for biodiversity and, and you know the, 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 the public 
and our public, we've seen through this lockdown period the re-engagement people are having with the countryside. We've seen the, the kind of almost uh, a, a newfound love of, of um, the, the countryside and, and people enjoying being in it, needing to be in it, needing to be in a landscape that, that is, is healthy and fresh and, and it's, it's very important for our well-being. And it'll be very important for the, the, um, the quality of the food that we produce al along with that. And so I think an agricultural bill will be very, would be very important. And, and as, as, as a nature-friendly farming network, it's something that, that we would support. Um, I'm not sure if, if any of my colleagues would like to add to that. Um, Michael, I can shift in there. I, I think unless we embrace it with, with legislation, there is a huge danger of, of, of drift, that things won't get done. We've got a huge challenge on our hands to even think about getting to net zero. Um, and we've got to keep our Northern Irish farms economically viable. And although it's great having the words that that's what we need to be doing, you have to have the tools to do it as well. And I don't believe that we'll be given the tools properly or the proper tools, perhaps, is a better way of putting it, without legislation bringing all the politicians and everybody within Northern Ireland on the one track to achieve our goals. And that means we will get proper funding, uh, we will get a fair crack of the whip, and we'll get everybody pushing behind everybody to get the goal achieved. Okay. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you both. Thank you, John. Uh, Hatsai? Hatsai? On the, yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Uh, and thanks very much, gentlemen, for coming along. It, it, as the Chair has said there, it ties in very nicely with um, our previous uh, scrutiny earlier on the, the climate change bill. Could I just ask you one thing now? Um, Obviously, with climate change, there's a huge implication of factors there, societal and other ways. But could I ask you, the one element is that in terms of production of your food, and how do we avoid a situation where potentially cheap imports come in and underpin well-produced, absolutely brilliantly, uh, environmentally produced and environmentally secured uh, uh, produce from, from your farms? How do we avoid that? Um, now, it's, it's grand to say, yes, consumers will vote with um, with their feet and they will go the environmental route, the environmentally secure route, but that's if they have the money to do so. If there's much of a dis disparity between uh, produce that's been brought in, uh, well, commercially from, from other jurisdictions or whatever, somebody who's basically living on the red line won't really have that security of choice if there's a big difference. So in other words, the, the question is, how do we ensure that your produce is competitive? We obviously know that it's, it's well environmentally secured and what you're doing is absolutely the right thing. How do we make sure that people buy that and it's competitively priced? Um, thank, thank you very much for that, that question. It's, um, I suppose that comes to the fundamentals of, of, of economics, doesn't it? It's, it's uh, you know, uh, there, there is a saying that you, um, you can't be green if you're in the red. And, uh, and, and I think that's, that's, an, important, that's an important point. Um, food poverty is a really big issue across, um, uh, across Northwest Europe, not, not least Ireland and Northern Ireland. And, and we've seen that as well, you know, coming to the fore through, through the, um, the lockdown periods. Um, I, I suppose. I suppose what we've got to what we've got to look at is is you know the the, the policies that that are there to produce food. So the, the support that that is there, and this is where our colleagues in in um, in Dara will will have the opportunity to 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 put funding in to ensure that we can produce the food that we can produce as as a, an agricultural sector. I mean, first and foremost, every one of us sitting here are businessmen, and 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 we, we run businesses. Well, there's no sense in us pricing ourselves out of a market and, and then sitting back and saying, but, but look at the birds, you know, and, and, and look at the wildlife. We've, yeah. we've got to be competitive and we've got to work within that and, and realize that, that that's, that's kind of the bottom line for all of us. So, so you know, let's not, let's not pretend that, that, that we're trying to paint a picture that's, that's all, you know, that's all green and, and, and jumping with wildlife. You know, it's, 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 we've got to work with nature. 
But working with nature, we find, and, and taking those, um, those approaches sometimes can help with our economics on the farm. And there is um, some research ongoing at the moment that um, the term that's being used is, is sometimes that, that less is more. On, on, on my farm, I've cut away back on my inputs and therefore my outputs um, are, are of more value to me. And that allows me then to, to, to balance my books in a way that doesn't increase the cost of the food that I'm producing. And others will have similar ways of, of working on that. But we've also got to rely on our, on our politicians and on, on our policymakers with the, the, um, the contracts and the agreements that they're going to make on world trade to ensure that everybody's coming from the same area, level of, of, um, uh, of input, that, that we're not importing cheap food that is damaging to, to the environments in the country and indeed damaging to the welfare of the people in those countries either. Um, again, I, I'll open that up to, to my colleagues here, that, that uh, if anybody wants to add to that, Tim, or view. Yeah, yeah, mine would be add. Thanks, Patsy, for a really blooming difficult question, actually. <laughs> Sorry, um, I'm not known for that. <laughs> I know, yes. It's, um, well, I mean, at the end of the day, if we want to trade in an open market, we can't stop people trading in here too. So there's no yeah. way we can affect. We have to. It has to be an open market. That's what we. That's what we. That's the way we work. And in, especially in, in the dairy market, eighty-five percent of our product is exported because we have such a small population. So eighty-five yeah. percent of what we produce is dried or produced, put into products, and is sent over the water. So we can hardly complain when other things come in here. But what I would say is, I think there are a number of easy strategies that we could all do to lessen our inputs that wouldn't affect our bottom line at all, except for the better. And I am a businessman. There's no way I want to be doing things that's going to lose me money. I mean, I quoted the mixed species thing earlier on. To me, that's almost a no-brainer. I mean, if you put in mixed wards that are better for wildlife, better for the soil, and you only need half the fertilizer. Fertilizer is made of oil. You know, this is just a no-brainer that everyone should be doing. But a lot of farmers just need a little bit of incentivization to do these types of steps. Uh, and we're putting in, again, less, fer or le less meal, uh, a lot less meal than most people. And because of that, then, we're actually able to uh, sell our milk to local producers through a vending machine that they can actually see the cows, they're in the fields the whole time, they're getting fed very little except grass, and they're prepared, prepared to pay a little bit more for that. But I don't think we're trying to exclude ourselves from the world market. What we're trying to say, I think, is that uh, like our group is a real mixture. There are some people who are organic in it, but a lot of people who aren't, like myself, but would be very happy if I could see a way to reduce our fertilizer down to at least half or further if we saw a route that wouldn't lose us money. Okay, thanks, Tom. Thank you. Okay, folks, we need to move on swiftly now because we're soon going to be cut off here. Rosemary? <laughs> Rosemary? See Rosemary. Yeah. Okay, we'll go and move on to Harry. Oh, sorry, Rosemary, you're in now. Yes, can you can you hear me? Yes, Rosemary. Okay, thank you. I'm going to sort of deviate slightly. You've talked about your farming enterprises, and can I thank you all for sharing your information with us? And it's just been very interesting listening to it. But can I ask what steps perhaps are you taking maybe to lower your carbon footprint in relation to the machinery, the necessary machinery you use? on your nature friendly farms? Well, maybe I could take that one, Mike. Okay, tell me. Yep. Well, I start sharing, I pass it on. Well, in my own, in my own uh, farm, because we have the cows outside all of the year, almost all of the year, and that doesn't happen by accident, by the way, so we have had to put in a series of laneways. So we have a lane to every field in the farm. By doing that, that means we can keep the cows out for the vast majority of the, of the year. They're out from February when they start to calve till midway through November. And then there's three months where we really need to get them off the face before they do much damage. By doing that, we need to make a quarter of the silage that most people need to make. 
and that means that we don't need the machinery to make that silage. All we do is get uh, um, contractors in for, for a short period for two days a year to actually do that. So, and that means also that when the cows are outside, they're spreading their own manure. So we have much less slurry to spread, which means again, we need much less use of machinery to spread that as well. And if you're putting out half the fertilizer, again, you need much less machinery to be able to do that. So you can actually adapt your farming system to, to sort of affect the amount of machinery you need on, on my farm anyway. Yeah, that, that might be the case in your farm, but when you're talking about arable farming and the ploughing of land that has necessitates being ploughed every year. Yeah, can, can I ask either, either Simon or, or David to, to pick up on that? I'm happy to take, take that one, Michael, yeah, I mean, you're quite right. Um, I rely heavily on machinery as, as an arable farmer, um, and I suppose that the question uh, the way I would answer it is it's not necessarily the machinery that I have, it's actually what I do with it. So the tillage techniques that I use to, to make sure that I preserve soil structure, the organic matter they're matting back to the soil through through organic manures and composts help to build the resilience in that soil. So yes, to, to produce crops, I have to till it, but I, I, I till it in, in, in the most, I suppose, efficient and sustainable manner I can when, it, when it's needed. We also we talked earlier about fertilizer, and I suppose just to give a, an arable, view on, on fertilizer and the how I use fertilizer. Um, well, the fertilizer I use is is liquid. So I, I make liquid fertilizer from urea. But before I even put it on, I analyze obviously the soil, uh, the pH of the soil and, and the, um, the nutrient d demand of the soil. And then as I'm applying throughout the season, uh, I will take leaf and sap analysis from the crop, which means I'm applying not only when the crop needs it, but actually what the crop needs. So my fertilizer use is down considerably over the last number of years as I've as I become more, I suppose, involved in this and, and understand more about what we're doing. And I, I have a, a soil nutritionist who helps me out, or a crop nutritionist who helps me out with this, and, and we add micronutrients when needed. So that, that reduction in fertilizer application through more efficient application when the crop needs it, um, it's already saving me considerably um, in terms of my efficiency and, and the cost of my inputs, but also my, my carbon impact as well. Okay, thank you. And I also uh, want to ask in relation to energy, you know, what uh, energy efficiency have you looked at? For example, uh, you have cow's milk, obviously, that enjoy, you need a lot of electricity for that. You have milk to keep cool, etc. You have your farms, your ha your homes to run. Are you talking about? Are you talking about wind, wind farm energy? What type of energy? Low, low energy. Are you so, using? So, so I mean that's a very important point, and and I think um, the farming community with with. Um, you know, maybe a, a bit more space than a lot of people around us. We we have an opportunity yeah. to to invest in um, the, the renewable energy side of things. So on, on our own farm here, um, you can put up eighty solar panels without planning permission, if, if with, without a phase a three phase system. So I installed those about five years ago, um, and uh, they have been very beneficial on the farm. And in fact. Um, this year we will have paid paid back the investment we've, we've put into that. We, we provide energy into the grid, but also you know we we use during the day and, and when the uh, you know when the, when it's daylight we're producing electricity for all of our needs on the farm as well. Uh, and I know some of my colleagues have taken opportunities there too. Tim, maybe you, you could talk about that. Yeah, we put, we put up a 20 kilowatt uh, solar panel system eight years ago and uh, it paid for itself in five years, uh, same as Mike's did. Uh, and we're looking to put another 16k system up. And I do think, I, mean, I think it's a really good question actually because I think uh, we're not saying look at us how well we're doing, but there are opportunities that solar panels are less than half the cost that they were 10 years ago. They're very cheap now to install and they're more efficient. So uh, you can now get a battery pack with solar panels 
which actually is uh, intelligent and can actually store your energy for you if you actually need that energy at night. In our system, we don't because cows are outside, so we don't really need that. But there are a lot of new technologies coming through that I think over the next 10 years can change uh, the, the energy supply of all farms in, in the country. Folks, we Thank have, you. We need to wrap this on very quickly because we're about to be cut off. Uh, Harry, quick one. Okay, thank you, Chair. Appreciate it. Just a wee crack on that, gentlemen. I enjoyed listening to these all. First of all, how could we encourage more wild flowers and bee friendly planting? Thank you. Keep it short. Um, thank, th thank you very much. The, the, um, it, it's, um, I mean, we, pollinators are really crucial to, to our, our environment, to, to our farming, and to our environment. And uh, I think it's very important the point that you've raised. Um, there is there is a, a pollinator plan that has just been launched um, for for Ireland, and and that includes bee lines across Northern Ireland, and planting of of uh, um, wild flowers is encouraged within that. Early days of the environmental farming scheme, there was um, a tree enhanced boundary option within that, where farmers could um, plant in. Um, trees which produce um, uh, nectar given plant the flowers and and uh, and berries in the in the uh, autumn time uh, unfortunately that was so popular in its first year that it was removed from the scheme going into the second third and fourth year and I think I would encourage the department to look at that as they're reviewing their policy because it seems to be a very very good uh, way of, of encouraging uh, pollinators and, and bees on the farm while flowers equally important that that um, there are opportunities within the, the arable system to to include um, grass margins and field margins that are important um, but even planting trees like willow uh, are they produce fantastic amounts of pollen earlier um, early in the year and ivy is a plant that some people don't like in their farm but it's a very very important species because it flowers very late in the year september october time and again gives late pollen to the the bees and the pollinators that are there so there i think there are lots of things that, that can be done to encourage um pollinators bees and insects on the farm and wildflowers with that Okay, then. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody else go there, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Harry. Uh, Morris? I'm Miller, am I? Go ahead, Morris. We hear you. All right, Chair. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, I can, yes. Chairman, I, I apologize for stepping out of the meeting. I had to go to another meeting. And, and I apologize to the two gentlemen uh, for missing most of their presentation. But I, 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 I am very interested as a country boy. Uh, and, and any method that increases the pollination species and increases insects and bird life and re re-establishes habitats. I just wanted to say, look, gentlemen, I appreciate everything that you brought here to the table today, uh, and I will be in touch to catch up on some of the things, and thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Morris, thank you. Not really. Yeah, William, very here. quickly before we finish off here. William? Hey, yeah, yeah, thank you again, and uh, I know we're a uh, quick one. Just to say, uh, in, in reducing uh, emissions and setting targets and doing that, uh, do you accept that it is wise to set targets that are achievable and that don't damage the agriculture sector and the, agri the, over the overall agriculture sector? Um, William, we're, we're farmers. Um, we're, we're all in business. And, and of course, that, that has to be part of it. But I think that that has to be um, put alongside um, that that you know looking at the change in policy and the support structure of funding allows us to make those moves at the same time as it, it gives us good support to do that. A, a lot of what we're talking about is is for the it's for society, it's for the public good, and therefore the support that that goes into farming and you know can support us as we make those transitions. But you, you, you're right that it's so important that that, that happens. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That was extremely interesting, so it was, uh, gentlemen. And we we'll look forward to seeing you again. I'm sorry, but I have to move on really quickly now before the broadcasting cuts us up. So we're looking forward to seeing you all again. Okay, thank you.
Thank you very much. No problem. Thank Take you, care now. Okay. Thank you, Craig. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay, members, um, bear in mind our time constraints now and the fact that we're about to be kicked out by broadcasting. Uh, can suggest that this is a suggestion. Can we note all of the written briefs and place agenda items 9, 11 and 12 on the website and provide any questions to Stella by the close of play today? Members okay with that? Okay. Um, can I propose that we defer consideration of the horse racing bill, uh, horse racing, uh, bill work plan until next week? Is that okay? Yeah. And members, can we jump to that step now to correspondence? Um, okay, correspondence is page 232. Um, members, okay to action the correspondence suggested in the page, index page 232. Okay, and okay. the forward work program, uh, page 376. There are a number of uh, updates to the forward work program as follows. The PSNI have now confirmed their attendance for the meeting on the 6th of May at 10 a.m. This will mean deferring the DERA oral evidence session on nature for and farming, as well as the closed session on consideration of the written evidence on the potential motion for nature friendly farming. Uh, the Chief Executive of Mid and East Antrim Borough Council has confirmed her attendance for the meeting on the 6th of May from 12 o'clock till 1.30. Can I, um, can I ask members to note that the broadcast and agreed that as a one-off to extend our usual finish time of 1pm in order to facilitate, facilitate this oral session, but the meeting will end promptly at 1.30pm. The department has advised that there is nothing further to report at this stage on the Green Growth Strategy Framework. Therefore, this has been removed from the forward work programme on the 6th of May to be rescheduled in due course. Do will provide oral evidence on the Climate Change Bill on the 27th of May. Uh, members okay with the forward work programme? I was talking about on the 6th of May, you mentioned something about the Nature Friendly Farming motion. Was yep. there a, a rescheduling of that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry, uh, yes. Here's what we've got here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go, so, so go ahead. Yes, in, in order to facilitate the ad, uh, addition of the witnesses from PSNI, and Mid and East Antrim Borough Council on the 6th of May. It's necessary to defer and reschedule some agenda items. And that'll be the, the DERA evidence on nature friendly farming and the committee consideration of its motion on nature friendly farming. But they'll be rescheduled okay. as soon as possible. Yeah, okay. But we, we should get it in the next few weeks then, yeah? Hopefully within the next few weeks, fingers crossed. Okay. Have we not thought, John? So yeah, yeah, just very briefly then, so the PS and I are coming on the 6th as well, are they? Yes? Yes, the PS and I will be coming on the 6th as well at 10 o'clock. That's grand, thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, um, members of any of our business before we adjourn? Okay. The next meeting will take place on Thursday, 6th of May at 9.45 a.m., and will be uh, a virtual meeting streamed on the assembly website. So, okay, members, thank you very much. I'm sorry right. for having a race at the, at the end, but I thought that that, uh, that brief and those briefings were very interesting this morning and deserved that bit of extra time. So, thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye now. Sound of Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland.